the uh, tape. We are recording. Okay. Um, good evening. It's March 27th, 2024. And this is a special meeting of the town council. In fact, it is a retreat. However, because we are meeting as a body, we have to have this as an open meeting. But we are allowed to do that by not having quorum physically present. And this particular meeting is accessible by real time via Zoom and by phone. And um, we will continue. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the March 27, 2024 special town council to meeting to order at 614. I apologize for the delay, but frankly, we decided that some of us wanted to eat some dinner and we didn't want to do that in front of an audience. Um, I'll call upon each counselor by name. They have the name they have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and let us know that you are present. Um, and then remember to mute your mic again. Patty Angelus. Present. Anna Devlin Goff. Present. Um, I'm sorry, I was distracted. Counselor Ette is, we're still waiting. Mm -hmm. He's on his way. Lynn Griesmer is present. Counselor Haneke. Present. Uh, Bob Hagner. Present. Counselor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Counselor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Councillor Walker. Present. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. And if you have technical issues, make sure we know. And if we have to, we'll disrupt the meeting. Um, or, or And discussion may be suspended. Uh, given that this is a special meeting of the town council for the purposes of retreat, there is no public comment, period. Um, we do not have any announcements, but I'm going to suggest that we pause briefly um, well, until Councillor Ette gets here. I'm not sure he will, he will get here that quickly. Okay, then I'm going to ask an, Athena, who is going to do a opening exercise with us. Thanks for indulging me in doing this. <laughs> I um, I really like these opening exercises because it gives us a chance to pause and sort of enter the room fully. Um, and I thought it would be appropriate to begin with this poem. I'm gonna give you a, a very bite-size version of um, a little introduction to what's called council practice. It's a an ancient practice that was, I mean, you can think about people gathered around a fire as being the original form of council practice. Um, and it, it has been practiced in um, First Nation peoples and continues to be practiced all over the world today, notably um, in the California prison system, in maximum security prisons with men serving life sentences, and those practices included victims, incarcerated people, and those working in the criminal justice system. It's been transformative in schools, nonprofit organizations, hospitals, law enforcement agencies, uh, faith-based communities, and jails. So the essence of council practice is to just listen fully to each other, speak from the heart, 
be spontaneous and let things arise and be lean of speech in consideration for how much time we have. Considering that we started the meeting um, a little bit late, I'm gonna ask us to move kind of quickly through this exercise and it's going to be very brief. So this is really just to get us thinking about listening to each other and taking time to fully listen to each other. I think when we have these meetings on Zoom, there's a strong tendency to raise your hand before the person who's speaking has even finished speaking, which indicates to me that, you know, you can't listen to someone and think of your own next words at the same time. And so um, I'd like to take a moment to really slow down and think about what listening means. So, um, giving yourselves a chance to reflect on these questions. I'd like to go around and um, if you can be lean of speech um, and listen from the heart to each other, speak from the heart about what is touching you with these words, speak spontaneously. You don't have to rehearse what you're going to say. And whoever is moved to speak first, please go ahead. You can raise your hand when a thought arises. Pat? The person in my life, one of them who is an excellent listener is Willie Meyer. I met him in prison um uh, in prison in Connecticut um where I was going to participate in an alternative to violence project uh, he was one of the inmates and was one of the facilitators um you share personal things in these workshops and I talk I'm trying to be lean this um I talked about some of my growing up, which was violent, and ways that I felt like it marked me. And Willie heard me. Worldwide Will was his acronym. He heard me at such a deep level um, that I was stunned during the break when he spoke with me. And eventually I became uh, one of the facilitators because of his willingness to really listen. Thank you for sharing that. Counselor Lord. I have a, a friend, I'm not gonna name her name, but um, who is a very excellent listener. Um, I know because she looks at me, her phone can go off and her head does not turn. And I tend to pause, I need to think and take time and a lot of other people jump right in with a response. And she gives me all the time I need. I think those three things really tell me. And then um, she really hears me even deeper than my words sometimes because I use them to not express a harm or a pain or a struggle. And uh, because she takes the time to really listen, she can uh, excavate those things. Thank you. Anna. Uh, I have a friend who recognizes that sometimes my brain goes faster than my mouth. And when I'm speaking or when I need her support, she's able to recognize my intention as well as my direct words. Um, and she can push back in a way that sees that. Um, and that's something I deeply value is it's not just a kind of tacit agreement. There's 
uh, sh she demonstrates understanding by sometimes challenging or asking questions that show she was paying attention even when I am not lean uh, and I have been going around in circles for five minutes. Um, and she pauses or stops me. And I think that for me personally is something that is really helpful for the way that my brain engages in conversation. Thank you. Councillor Walker, I'm recognizing that you're on Zoom. Is there something you'd like to share? You don't have to. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm thinking of my sister um, who is an excellent listener. And I feel like uh, part of it is because she really knows me very well um, and has known me for obviously my entire life. Um, and so I think a lot of the times when I'm talking to her, um, she can dissect what I'm saying as as it reflects deeper in just the moment, but as it relates to my past and to things that we've experienced before. Um, and something that I really love about talking to my sister is that she usually will sort of lets me go first because I will go and go and go. And then she says, um, what do you want from me? Do you just want me to listen? Do you want me to give you advice? Do you like, how do you want me to answer this? And I really appreciate that from her because sometimes I don't want someone to say anything. I just want someone to listen. And sometimes I need guidance and that's what I need. But allowing me to choose that um, is something that I feel that makes me feel really heard. Um, and it also makes me feel really understood because sometimes I go into things without saying what it is that I need or want as an outcome. Um, and so again, it's just like, she makes me take the time to think about what it is that I'm really saying and what it is that I really need in that moment. And that's really, um, special to me. Thank you. Paul and Dave, I'm also recognizing that you're in our circle. If there's anything you'd like to share or if anything else, anyone else would like to share something. Lynn? So one of the people that I have always seen as an excellent listener is a former colleague at the University of Massachusetts. And one of the reasons I would know he was listening was because he would ask me to think about something in a different way by asking questions. And I never completely realized the value of that until... Um, I was actually doing a case study at the Kennedy School, and it was because somebody dared to ask questions differently that our nation was actually prevented from being affected by swine flu. So. Thank you. Councillor Ryan. I have a good friend. Uh, we don't do this often, but we will go for long walks on the bike path. And um, we just talk for about an hour or so, trying not to get run over by cyclists and rollerbladers. Um, like Anna, I know he's listening because he asked me good questions. Um, he's someone that um, very helpful for me. So I'm due for another walk on the bike path. Thank you all for sharing and for taking the time to think about this. I'm going to leave you with a quote by Marshall Rosenberg, who is an American psychologist who helped develop nonviolent communication. And I invite you to bring what you recognize in other people who are good listeners into the meeting tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ette, are you connected yet? No. Okay, take your time, but why don't you just push your mic and say present, and that way we know you're here. Present. Thank you. And if you would like to catch up and have some dinner, just stay off video, okay? Um, so uh, the next agenda item, I would like us to spend 20 minutes max, if possible. Um, it's agenda item called meeting management. 
and it's intentionally broad. There are many issues that counselors might want to bring up, uh, but among them, I hope we will focus on the last few meetings of the town council. When we were confronted with a whole series of challenges to our obligation to ensure a peaceable and orderly process. We regularly anticipate that public comment section of the meeting might be challenging and have part have put in place clear procedures to ensure that members of the public can express their opinions without interruption or contention. In my view, this has worked reasonably well, except for offensive public comments like we had last week or two weeks ago, and some audience responses following comments that take away from other speakers' time. At one of our recent meetings, when it came time for counselors to do their work, the, to do our work, the situation deteriorated and what should have been an orderly discussion of difficult choices facing the council became a confused and chaotic scene. I have already made some adjustments in my own meeting management, but look forward to making more. They include asking people if they need a reading period, if particularly if something has been added into the packet at the last minute, calling for a recess when people could not hear, and seeking a motion and a vote to adjourn. I've heard many concerns expressed by members of the council and the public about how the council will ensure this scenario is not repeated. It is a matter, it is not a matter of the public's interest versus the council's interest. If the council cannot carry out its responsibilities in a thoughtful and deliberate way, then the public cannot be served. So as you might imagine, Athena and I and others have discussed this at length. And so we wanna begin this discussion with some clarification about how the council can utilize and um, our rules, rules and our procedures during meetings. So Athena is gonna start out by addressing peaceable and offensive public comments. So, what the rules don't include is really what to do in each scenario, because there are so many scenarios that can come up and the rules don't say, if this happens, then here's what we do. There are motions that you can make and there's rules about what people should and shouldn't do at meetings, but it doesn't say, if this happens, then here's what we all do. And so I'd like to clarify some of those ways that you can address these situations according to our rules according to the council's rules. So in rule six code of conduct, there are rules about counselors code of conduct in 6-1A and audience code of conduct in 6-2C. And both of them refer to being um, order, behaving in orderly procedure um, and not being disruptive during the meeting. Both of them say that if the um, presiding officer finds that the meeting is being disrupted, that a recess can be called. If any counselor finds that the meeting is being disruptive, disruptive, they can request the president call a recess or they can make a motion to recess. Um, I'll get later on, we'll come back to what to do if you can't hear, but I think there were certainly counselors at the meeting um, earlier this month who couldn't hear what was going on. I know Lynn couldn't hear what I was saying and so on. So there is a motion in the rules 7.1 that says raise a question of privilege. And the rules don't really explain what that means, but a question of privilege is there's so much noise in this room that I can't hear what people are saying. Or you could raise a point of order that you can't hear what's going on, or you don't know the motion on the table, or you don't know if, what what's happening in the meeting. Um, and counselors can raise that as an issue to help the president manage the meeting at that time. Um, to address some of the uh, offensive public comments, GOL took this up very recently because um, we had the Supreme Judicial Court reading about the Southboro case. Um, and so there was some conversation at GOL about public comment, but it, I don't think the committee really got into um, First Amendment rights as in-depth as what we've been dealing with now. Um, and first, I'm gonna say something 
that was said originally by Abraham Lincoln, um, referring to the First Amendment. Nothing but the very sternest necessity can ever justify abridging the liberties of the people. A government had better go to the very extreme of toleration than to do aught that could be construed as an interference with or jeopardize in any degree the common rights of its citizens. The courts have been very protective of freedom of speech, which includes hate speech. There are only certain, certain categories of speech that the First Amendment does not protect, which include fighting words, true threats, harassment, and incitement of imminent lawless action. Calling an individual commenter a derogatory term, particularly if that comment threatens violence or harm against them, can be regulated as hate speech. Violent words directed to an individual or their family can be regulated as hate speech and inciting violence. What can't be regulated is uh, commenting about people as a group. And so it's very difficult to regulate the content of speech without getting into issues of First Amendment rights. Maintaining a neutral, dispassionate tone and expression and treating each speaker equally will discourage attacks at meetings and will help protect the council from legal challenges claiming an infringement of constitutional rights. Um, there was a lower court ruling about regulating the content of speech in terms of matters within the jurisdiction of the body. And because that was a lower court ruling, which allowed a body to restrict comments only to matters within its jurisdiction as a way to manage its meetings, um, that hasn't been challenged to a higher court. And so my advice to the council president and, and other chairs has been to restrict merely the time, place, and manner. So if someone is not shouting out during a meeting, that can't, um, and they're just taking their two or three minute public comment period, I've said, they get their two or three public comment period. That's how they exercise their freedom of speech. And that's really the most regulation that we can do without being challenged. So one of the other things, and I did mention this earlier, and that is that on a periodic basis, new material is introduced at the meeting. And what we really wanna do is encourage people, if the person who is presiding doesn't suggest it, to just say, I need a reading period, or can we recess while I read these materials so that people don't feel that they haven't had time to absorb the materials? Athena? Um, I've already touched on uh, what counselors can do uh, if they can't hear during the meeting or if there's something else that's disrupting the meeting that the chair isn't addressing. Um, and I just want to highlight the fact that it's the 13 of you who are participating in this together. And if you feel that the council president or the chair of the meeting isn't uh, paying attention to the issue that's going on, then the, the other 12 of you can raise a point of order or a point of personal privilege to address that issue. Um, the next thing Lynn had asked me to speak about was the best way to consider parla parliamentary questions during a meeting. And in conversations with Lynn and other chairs um, several times, I've advised that we slow down a little bit because at meetings, sometimes it can feel like an emergency to make a decision and to figure out what we do next. And sometimes we just need one minute or we just need 45 seconds to think about what to do next or confer with someone to figure out what's going on before we take a next step. So my advice in any question of parliamentary procedure or in terms of following the council's rules or anything else that we're unsure of in a meeting is to take a brief pause and collect ourselves and answer a question before we move on. So I see several hands and we'll move to that in a moment. Um, I recognize that the responsibility for an orderly and thoughtful process ultimately resides not just with the person presiding, but with the whole body. Are there other thoughts that you would like to offer to me as the presiding officer of the council or to chairs and to the council at large regarding the conduct of our meetings? Please feel free to do so now or in the future. Proposed rule changes should come as proposals to the council. 
So I'm going to go ahead and call on George Ryan. I see it as two separate. I see it as two separate issues. Um, the first has to do with obvious hate speech, which is what we encountered the last meeting. It's not addressed to anything we're doing. It's it's just hate speech. It's, and I wonder if we're just too afraid of being sued to simply say that that kind of speech is just not acceptable. Um, so that's the first thing. It's just, you know, people get angry, people get upset. I mean, I looked at the Southboro case. I'm sure many of you did as well. It seemed to me pretty much a no-brainer. Um, and the, the court ruled correctly, but I don't see how that leads to the conclusion that if someone comes and just starts uttering hateful words, that's somehow an exercise of their First Amendment freedom. It seems like content has to be, I mean, there has to be something they're trying to address to what we're doing and of what's in front of us as a matter. And clearly that's not what was happening, at least in one or two cases the last time. What if somebody comes and wants to just utter pornographic words because they get off on that sort of thing? Is that we just sit there for two minutes while that happens? I realize this is difficult. I guess I struggle with the idea that somehow because the lawyers have said there's nothing we can do, and we just sit back and I wonder if we just don't invite a suit. I mean, what's wrong with being sued? I'd like to see a Southboro-like decision by the Supreme Judicial Court where they quote the words of the person who, right, they did it in the Southboro case and we all read it and we thought, yeah, they're right. The, the presiding officer was out of bounds. The rules were way too extreme. It made sense. I'd like to see a similar case where someone does what would happen to us two weeks ago and put the words in their decision then. I'd like to see that. And if they're willing to do that, fine. Anyway, I've, that's one. The other is what happened to us. In other words, there's the issue of what happens when people come and do and speak hateful ways and how do we deal with that. Then there's the issue of what we do when a meeting is out of control. We actually did recess. Took a while, but we recessed. Then we came back and it was still out of control and we never adjourned. So I need to hear from my colleagues whether they share my sense that we should have adjourned. That meeting was out of control. We needed, as Northampton Council did, we needed to stop, come back, and do it in a manner where we could hear each other and talk to each other. But we didn't. We went ahead, we had votes, we made a decision. So if people think that's okay, they need to say so. I th think that it was very much not okay. I was upset by it then, I'm upset by it now. So I need to hear from you because I've spoken enough on it. So I'm gonna be lean and stop. But it seems two issues. One is what happens when people do hateful or say hateful things to us? How do we deal with that? The other is what do we do about our own behavior when the meeting is out of control? Pam Rooney. I wanted to react to the uh, the comment about we could always have a reading period if something is is has been presented to us. Um, that's that's an alternative, I think. But um, in the in a setting where there's a great deal of emotion and engaged in the in the process, seeing something for the very first time in in the face of great emotion. I think it puts everyone at an unfair advantage. And I don't think we should ever be discussing something that we had never seen before. There was no hard copy for us to look at. Um, I, I didn't see it until it was, you know, part of the words were being read or um, I, it, it just was not, it put us in a really bad spot to be reacting to um, what was being presented, and I think it puts it put it puts us in a bad light, but it also um, um, it doesn't allow us to do our best work. And I think we could have we could have responded in different manners had we digested what was being presented. Okay, uh, Bob Hagner. I'm gonna. I was gonna bring up a separate issue, so I'll just pass for now. Okay, Andy. 
Yeah, I'm glad I'm following what Pam just uh, said because uh, what um, I found very difficult about the beginning of that meeting and I think haunted throughout the meeting was that uh, changes were made to the motion before the motion was offered, but we didn't have the motion. So we didn't have the motion that we were going to be um, dealing with. And uh, that's unusual for us um, as a council. We, um, I can't recall an occasion where a motion has been so significantly changed uh, between what was posted and what we then were discussing, which then put me in an awkward position because I had um, prepared a red line version showing deletions additions to a motion that I expected to be coming forward, which was not the motion that came forward. So I was in a very strange position of trying to uh, explain motions and pieces that were uh, really needed to be looked at as a whole to understand and judged as a whole to understand. So I think that there were just sort of problems that right from the beginning and um i um i think it was uh the variety of reasons that that happened um obviously there were some members of the audience who were uh, very engaged in a disruptive way there were uh, some uh there was confusion for the reasons that i have just stated and uh there was a uh, lack of uh, ability to really focus on a discussion of what uh, was uh, the, the, we couldn't discuss the motion on the floor as noted because we didn't have the motion on the floor. So there were, uh, it, it was, uh, a whole lot of different problems that um, came about, uh, and uh, I am going to conclude by uh, say, reflecting on what I heard about how Northampton handled a similar situation over the same issue at its council meeting, um, and it adjourned the council meeting without making a decision and reconvened after 48 hours notice on Zoom. And uh, it was able then to have a more orderly conversation and to actually reach a result that belonged to the council. Um, and I just don't think that we were there. Um, it, it was not, we didn't end up, we did end up with the motion um, and uh, it is what was voted, and I accept that. But uh, I think that the process really was problematic, and uh, I'm not convinced that the motion would have been the same had we been in this room it, with the technology that's available to us in this room and had been able to proceed in our normal course of business. Councillor Haneke? A couple of things. Um, amendments are part of our job. Amendments night of are part of our job. To suggest that we should never discuss something that we have never seen before um, potentially means we should never amend anything or we should delay every time there's an amendment on the floor. Um, I can't agree with that. We have had substitute motions presented by Kathy Shane in the past five years that are completely different from what's on the floor. Uh, that we've had to deal, deal with night of to say that what happened on that night was unique is not the case. It's selective memory in my mind of 
what this council over five years has done at meetings um, during motions. Um, I think when a motion is potentially a motion to amend or a motion is a potential surprise, taking time and a recess to get it on everyone's screen so everyone can read is the right thing to do. Not to, to take the time and if it's still there, then there are methods within our rules that can be used to need more time. Um, we could also potentially take advantage of court dicta in prior cases that has indicated that if opinions are posted to the public first, that they can be put in the packet and distributed to all council members. We've never really taken advantage of that. I know Kathy has pushed us to do so with memos she's written and all. Um, our clerk and our president had every motion that councilors wanted to make before that meeting, but did not put it out to all the councilors or many of the motions because they asked for them. If they had been put in the packet by a certain deadline, all councilors could have had that. And court dicta has indicated that that might not have, likely does not violate open meeting law and can be done so we can rethink our procedures. As to George's two issues, we're a government body and the first amendment is broad. It's very distasteful to have to sit and listen to that but we need to, because if we start regulating some speech, what, where does it stop? Do you ha not have to listen to what you don't wanna hear? Even if it's not hate speech, what is deemed hate speech? Different people believe different things on what hate speech is. I think there are other ways that we could con consider dealing with it. Um, if it continues to happen and if that type of what I believe is non-resident speaking continues to happen. There are other ways to deal with that. Removing Zoom public comments, not necessarily ideal. I'm not arguing for it, but it's something to consider if it keeps happening. Pre-registration like is required in Cambridge or Somerville. Serious pre-registration, like by 5 p.m. web forms pre-registration is potential. You know, there are other ways to deal with it. And as for your other, um, um, Councillor Ryan, your other question, the recess is what we should have done, another recess on that night, not adjourn, and tried to get it under control through taking breaks. George, I'm sorry, Robert, Bob, do you want to come back to you or shall I go on to Anna? No, you can, you can move on. Anna? So... To Pam and Andy's point, and well, addressing Pam and Andy's point, but I think echoing what Mandy just said, what Councillor Haneke just said, we have always had the ability to make edits and make amendments. I'm curious about exploring the idea of specifying a limit on edits, but I'm really even uncomfortable saying that because then it is limiting our ability to do our jobs. Um, in the instance we it, that that's being discussed, we did have the uh, the motion in the original text. And Andy, like you said, folks brought amendments. I think to say that the sponsors can't bring amendments to their own resolution or proclamation is now privileging non-sponsors of any given proclamation or resolution. Because to your point, Andy, I hadn't seen your redlined version. How is that any different than the sponsors bringing amendments? Um, not allowing them that privilege as a counselor, I think would be inappropriate. We can't send them ahead of, well, Mandy's got some fancy new thing, but until tonight, my understanding was we can't send them ahead of time without violating open meeting law, printing them out ahead of time and distributing them to the council would have also been a violation. I, we need to have the ability to make amendments and I prefer those amendments to be thought out ahead of time um, and then able to be discussed as we do. Um, George, I think the, I like the idea of saying, we're not scared of a lawsuit. We're going to stand up for what's right. My concern is that we'd be the next South borough, but worse. And that's something that we really didn't want to have happen would suddenly become protected. I'm not saying that is the reality, but I think that's my concern with it, right? Is, is that if we did it, it would go all the way through those courts, just like South borough did. And then 
become another thing that we can't regulate in any way and get and get worse. Um, one of the things that I am curious about is if there's a way to work uh, with our state delegation or with other folks to look at open meeting law and what open meeting law says about public comment to see and, and public access and uh, consider how there might be more protections against hate speech in that way without violating the First Amendment. It's a vague thought, but Open meeting law governs a lot of what we do and does talk about public engagement and public comment. So I'm curious about uh, that as an avenue as well. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer? Um, yeah, I, I was the only uh, counselor that was remote, so I wasn't in the room. So I feel like I did have a different experience than everyone else. I mean, I was sort of more looking in from the outside. It seemed to me they we, the where things went off the rails is that the, well, there was a response reaction from the audience. And I think from the spont council sponsors that there was re resistance to the council making any amendments. So that's, so just the fact that amendments were made and that then ultimately they were voted on that that wasn't, Again, that that that's when things, I think, the audience became angry, um, and when, so I had a a resident um, at a district meeting raise the question, and then he wrote again today because I guess he had gone to look at the rules of procedure, and the first recess, what the what did the sponsors ask for the recess, and when they came back from the recess, indicating that the council sponsors. If the amendments, because I guess the amendments had been voted at that point, I can't, that they no longer wanted to be sponsors. And is it true that uh, rules of procedure 8.8 .8 say that if the sponsors are going to take their names off, that has to be on the agenda? So I just wonder if there's different points at which we, you know, because it, we were on, I guess, new territory, um, that we, our rules of procedure might have directed us to go in different directions, but we, you know, didn't go back and look at them. <laughs> Athena, do you want to speak to that? Council rules 8.8 .8 state at the request of any sponsor or sponsors of a measure, a measure shall be withdrawn from consideration in the council and in all council committees to which the matter has been referred, provided the withdrawal is on the agenda of a council meeting. No vote shall be required. However, if at that meeting, Sponsors of the measure do not unanimously agree to withdraw a matter. The matter shall not be withdrawn. At that time, upon request, any counselor shall have their individual sponsorship removed or added. The rules don't address this specific situation. In my opinion, and if the president had asked me at that time, I would have said if the if a counselor calls a point of order and states that the motion that is being considered and or is being voted on is out of order, then the president could have ruled whether the motion to adopt the resolution was in or out of order or to amend the resolution was in or out of order. And the council, if they disagreed with that ruling, could have voted to overturn the president's ruling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So th it is a question that's not clearly defined in the rules. So the council gets to decide. Nobody raised a point of order at that time that the motion that was on the floor was out of order. It was stated that it was out of order or that one counselor thought that it was out of order. But if a counselor raised that as a point of order, the motion that's being voted on is not in order because there's not a sponsor, then the president would have had an opportunity to rule on that point of order. And if there were a counselor who disagreed with that ruling, then a vote could be taken by the council on whether or not the motion on the floor was in order. I know that I'm repeating a lot of the same words again and again, and so that can sound like a spiral, and I apologize for that, but I'm happy to answer questions if that's not clear. Kathy? I also want to just point out that we are at almost 30 minutes now. Okay, I'll be really quick. Mandy brought up an instance, who knows whether it's our first year or second year, where I had literally a substitute amendment. And since I wasn't allowed for the whole thing, um, a whole different list, <laughs> it threw one out. And I wasn't allowed to give it to any counts, anyone in the council before I came. But we, it was substantive enough. Uh, one counselor and everyone agreed we needed 10 minutes to read it. 
and so it showed up on the screen. Everyone had it in their hands. So I think, um, and I'm talking about not a motion, but actually a substantive piece, so as opposed to the motion. So in this case, if we had had that time, people could have cross-matched um, things that they had scratched up. Um, so I think, in general, if there's a substantive change in a document that we had received in our material, that we should just have uh, a five minute, 10 minute, you know, if it's if it's two paragraphs, it doesn't have to be that long, but people need a chance to read it. Right. You know, so it's just, that would have made enough of a difference so people wouldn't have had to say, well, which word, which words change? You know, I like that change, mm -hmm. you know? And we, we never had that time. And then finally we got it on the screen. So the one time I did do that, we took a pause. I also think it's very difficult. Um, and I'm I'm talking, looking forward. If we've got a substantive, this is, I finally had the lawyer say, if I have something substantive and long to say, as long as I speak to it for two minutes or three minutes, then I can submit a written document, which really works when you're not voting on it that night. Um, but I had something on a housing policy and there was never any time to say everything I need to say in two to three minutes. So our attorney said, if there's something substantive and you summarize it, you can put your document in the record. So this wouldn't apply to what we were dealing with a resolution, but we do, we did, that's okay. That we're not violating open meeting law by showing we think something needs significant changes. So I just wanted to hawk back because it was, it promoted a, a, a good discussion. I completely lost um, that way back when, <laughs> but it was a good discussion. Okay. Pat. I'll try to be lean. I, I want to address um, an inaccuracy. No, I, I can do it. Oh, um, I'm getting help. Old, old ladies need help. Um, we did not say we would not accept amendments. We also accepted uh, Jennifer's amendment passed by the group. It was not taken out as far as I know. What the sponsors, and I'm speaking now for Mandy and Alicia, but they can speak for themselves as well. We could not accept the amendments that Andy was putting forward that included a reference to Hamas. When we were talking not about Hamas, we were talking about the Palestinian people and what was happening to them since Hamas's dreadful, horrible attack. When I tried to get Palestinian people simply mentioned in the uh, October, I believe it was October 16th resolution, I was voted down. I accepted that. Didn't like it, but I accepted it. It was not possible for me as a sponsor to accept Andy's amendments. That is why I withdrew my name not because I wasn't willing to accept any amendments. And that's, people need to uh, remember that. It, it, they need to remember things a little bit more accurately sometimes, myself included. I'm going to go to Bob and then to Councillor Walker. Yeah, I just wanted to um, suggest that if we're faced with a, a situation like we were faced with, we just adjourn the meeting and reconvene in 48 hours and reconvene on Zoom so we can have a, a discussion the way that we should. Um, the, one, the one question I wanted to pose to Athena is whether it's possible to uh, cut off someone after two minutes. In other words, we give them two minutes to talk. If they're going beyond two minutes, can we actually cut them off or do we have to ask them to stop? So in the memo that I wrote to the council when this issue first came up at a council committee meeting, my advice was that a chair shouldn't do something in a Zoom meeting that you wouldn't do in person. And if you wouldn't forcibly silence a person 
in an in-person meeting, then we shouldn't mute a person on Zoom. So my advice has been for the chair or the president to ask that person to wrap up their comments and not to use the mute button as a way to silence people. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I realize it's difficult to to stop someone who's in the room. It's easy yes. to tech, with technology on Zoom, right. but that would be unfair to the people on Zoom. So it, it most people are pretty good about it, but there are some who just keep mm -hmm. rambling on and it just extends the meeting with very little new information for us to, to deal with, that's all. And the other thing that I would caution as a chair would be that if you're going to limit one person to two minutes, you just need to be consistent with everyone who speaks and make sure that you're not letting one person go over and not everybody else. Right. Councillor Walker, you've not spoken before. Um, thank you. I wasn't going to raise my hand because I <clears throat> was essentially going to say everything that Mandy Joe already said, but I just thought that I might also answer George's question and how he would, how he wanted to know how uh, colleagues might have wanted that a situation to be addressed. And I just also agree that we should have or could have taken a recess. Um, and I think that uh, at our last council meeting, there was um, an instance where we couldn't be heard or we couldn't hear each other uh, because of the audience. And we took a recess. I think that was extended and extended until we could hear each other and we got back to deliberation. And I think that that was a similar course that we could have taken at that meeting. Um, and I would hope that that's what we would do because I would prefer, unless we're taking really long recesses and not getting anywhere, then I think adjourning might be appropriate, but I don't think we should have jumped to adjourning. I think we should start with taking recesses. Mm -hmm. um there's three counselors that have spoken once. I'd like to go ahead and have an opportunity for you to speak again, and then we're going to end this and move on to the original purpose of this retreat. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify. I th I think when I put in my friendly amendment, it was had already been stated that the uh, that I heard that the, the sponsors, that we could make amendments, because I think Mandy addressed it. This was before Andy had made his amendments. It was just, there was the whole issue of whether amendments would be entertained. And that came up before I had put out my amendment or in, Andy had. So there was, I, I felt like that, we were sort of a little off our game from that moment, because it was, we, whenever something comes before us, we discuss it, we make amendments, but there was a, it, the discussion started with some caution about um, not amending the resolution before anybody had made one. And I, I thought that kind of set all of us a, a bit off our game. Councillor Ette, I'm gonna go to you and then on to the other councillors that have not, that have spoken. Um, so speaking about the the meeting that we had or the votes for the resolution. I think, and this discussion we're having this evening, it's important to realize that we have a duty to ourselves as members of the council and also a duty to ourselves as a council speaking to and with the public. And I think something that we should be emphasizing, I think we've done that tonight, is stress the importance of discussion and deliberation. I think what was lost that night was that we were held captive by the desire to have a decision that night and that limited our ability to discuss. And so um, I'll just use this opportunity to um, speak to the public um, there are votes that are made and decisions that we can arrive at, but we can use the proper channels and avenues to get to those decisions. And that usually is going to involve um, speaking just like we're doing and having um, amendments, friendly or unfriendly as the case may be. There will be further opportunities where disruptive behavior will occur. But if we can remember that 
within this space, we have an opportunity to, again, speak among ourselves and that not just arriving at the right result, but using the right process to get to that result, I think um, that will save us a lot of the trouble that we had from then up to the present moment. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, I'm just gonna <clears throat> keep it to one very brief um, observation and suggestion to think about for the future, but not for discussion tonight. And that is when we deal with complex issues like bylaws and uh, policies, it goes through a committee. And the committee has a fairly complete discussion and uh, really works through what amendments it might think appropriate. And uh, so what may be initially suggested within the referral to a committee by the council or initiated within the committee is uh, can be changed um, and fairly significantly changed. We have an odd thing that we've done with resolutions, and that is that it only goes to GOL. GOL has uh, a limited charge of saying, is it clear, consistent, and actionable, which are not clearly defined terms, but certain, but I think that it is understood to not go to the substance of what is um, there. Uh, and uh, so the GOL does not look at um, and consider whether there are significant changes. Um, and I, this was the first time we've had a resolution maybe the second, because I think Pat actually raised another one that um, is, was a fair point to raise. Um, but is there a time when a resolution really ought to not come directly to the council as a whole, but should start in a council committee and let the committee um, have some of that discussion and make sure that um, it's fully understood that whatever is getting to the uh, council is going to be a council action, not an action that's recommended by an outside group that initially sponsored uh, or advocated for the resolution, the bylaw, or the policy. So I, I, I just urge us in the future time to think about that question as to whether uh, we ought to be having a committee process that is more rigorous than in uh, the one that currently exists of just, is it clear, consistent and actionable? Okay, George, final comment? As you can see, I'm not a First Amendment absolutist, just because I think it's a fallacy actually to think because it's difficult to draw a line means you can't draw a line. I'm going to raise this with GOL, and if anyone else is interested in the idea of trying to draw a line, I'd be happy to hear from you. But I was intrigued by Mandy's suggestion of Zoom does seem to be a particular challenge, and perhaps we you could instruct GOL if the council so wishes, or GOL can just take it up on its own. Should we look at some of the stricter regulations that some communities have related to Zoom? Would that be helpful? Thank you. Um, we're going to move on. If anybody needs to take a break, please just get up anytime you want. Um, so um, the sheets that I sent out to you initially um, were actually developed with input from various people. And frankly, we got distracted and didn't get as much input. What they pointed out for me is this was absolutely not a perfect system, but more importantly, it pointed out to me that our goals are not perfect goals. So um, what I would like to do is explain the sheet I sent you, not because it's perfect, but just so you understand it. And then uh, we're going to actually go on and, um, both the town manager and the assistant town manager uh, with working with staff 
have uh, various places where they would like to comment on different goals. And we're going to make sure we have that opportunity. At the end of the evening, I would like us to make sure we agree on some next steps um, so that we go forward. So the sheet that Athena passed out to you at the beginning of the meeting is similar to what was sent to you, but frankly, it's different. Um, it's different because I had to make a correction because of a snafu in receipt of material. Um, the the initial the actual numbers that appear are what were on individual counselors. Um, Councillor Walker, have you been? This is what was sent to you earlier today. I just wanted to make sure it's the the email where you said take two. I'm sorry. The, the email that was titled second um, take. Take two of the yeah, ranking. take two. Thank you. Yes, that okay. is the one. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Um, so basically, um, and I also I really want to stress this is an initial take. This is not final. Um, I know I have things I would change. So the actual numbers are what people put in the matrix, and those were rankings within goals. Okay. And then with a desire to say, well, if you look across the sub goals, are there sub goals that you would rank in any order? I think this is the most important sub goal. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if you said it was the most important sub goal and it was one of your top five, then you see a double or you see an X in the box. If it was one of your second five, you see just one slanted thing in your box. Um, this is not, you know, um, this is not what I would call anyway. Uh, and then at some point today, somebody suggested that I then take an average, and I did, and basically it didn't change anything. The yellows are based on the numbers only. They are not based on any of the slashes. And the yellows are, except for one place I think I made a mistake, are for anything that ha was an average of 2.5 or lower, and or 30, and there's one I made a mistake on. And that is basically within goals and out of goals. Having said that, when we get to certain pages, you'll see that the X's tend to be very consistent with where the highest important rank was. And sometimes it's not. And again, I just want to stress that when we're done with this whole conversation, the goal is to have counselors re-rank based on some guidelines we all agree on. So with that, we're going to start with the climate action goal. And it has five subparts, sub goals. And I think if, unless the council would like to ask, okay, let's ask questions, Pam. Thank you. Um, I never got the impression that I was supposed to prioritize the the five, six primary goals. Nobody ever said, Pam, is climate is climate more important than than it, community health? It was to provide so how would we ever how would we ever and I'm I misled you. Okay. It was to prioritize the sub goals within not the goals, the sub goals. So you might have said, I believe that uh, using a climate lens is the most important yeah. sub goal, not that climate is the most goal, important goal. Anna. So Lynn heard my rant about this earlier today, um, but I will repeat it for the rest of you lucky ducks who didn't get to hear it. Uh, my main takeaway from this exercise, and I just wanted to say it on the outset, is that 
GOL is currently discussing the town manager evaluation process, and it is very, very abundantly clear to me that we also need to examine our expectations around setting goals. Uh, as I looked at these and as I went through and prioritized, I would prioritize things that were maybe broad because I felt they included some of the more specific goals. For example, if we're looking at the front page, uh, taking action on portions of the Climate Ad Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, that includes supporting development of climate action bylaws. And so um, I just wanted to note that this is so imperfect uh, and it's our own doing um, because <laughs> we've created goals that are all over the place in terms of their specificity, in terms of their um, demand, all of it. So this is a challenging exercise and, and I'm hoping that it also will lead to some clarity in the process of creating goals going forward. And GOL has that on our on our list. Yeah. Absolutely. Councillor Haneke. Um, one question and one comment. The question is, um, you alluded to maybe the manager having surveyed staff about their potential priorities or thoughts on all of these goals. Is there a document that we will get that has those thoughts so that counselors can see them or is it just gonna be all reported orally? Um, and the second one was when I was doing these rankings, one of the things I found was um, it was hard for me to rank things that fell to only sort of within town staff purview, uh, looking at climate action, something like complete the JPE because the council no longer has anything to do with that mm -hmm. um, versus something that would eventually come back to the council. And how do I yeah. rank those two? Because I, I I want us to be able to act on some stuff that are within these goals. But if I don't rank those high, we'll never be able to act on them unless we're doing them themselves. And the last discussion seems to indicate maybe there's some disagreement as to whether counselors should propose stuff. Um, <laughs> but um, But yet I don't want the other things that don't ever come back to us lost. So that was also a hard thing to yeah. score within the rankings. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, what I also, um, I, I feel like some of the rankings don't really necessarily reflect like, like where I have a five doesn't mean it's not a priority. So for example, I um, activities at, at, that were already in process, like supporting the elementary school building committee and the Jones Library building committee, I didn't even rank those because those are happening. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly mm -hmm. the, the elementary school is going to happen. Yeah. And even with CRESS, like we just hired a new director, CRESS is happening, but like the resident oversight board and reviewing the public safety protocols, mm -hmm. I rank those higher, not because I think they're higher than CRESS, but just I want to see those happen in the others. Are, so, yeah. Um, there, you're, each of you is getting many nodding heads because we all confronted the same problems. Kathy. So if, if and not that anyone wants to stare at the grid to see how many blanks there are, but you'll see that Kathy has lots of blanks because I decided I would only rank one or two within the categories unless I thought they were all important. And then I found missing things that were in our financial category and were in our things. So for example, um, bringing in more money from the colleges and universities, um, you know, trying to, uh, so I had a few that I added when I did my overall ranking yes. <laughs> um, that weren't even on the list. You know, so when a, a general comment on this exercise um, is I think it would be good to do this before we cement next year's goals mm -hmm. uh, because um, we could winnow down, you know, things that either, you know, no one would think that the elementary school building is low on my priority list, but it's moving right along. So I didn't give it a rank. You know, I didn't feel like I needed to draw to anyone's attention. So being really careful about what we do, because when you count them up, otherwise they're an amazing number. And then my last comment is, although I sometimes gave it a high, the general use a climate lens whenever making budget, da, da, da. I like those, but they're hard. To, they're not particularly actionable, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So that is a statement of what we want to do. Shouldn't be 
you know, so now the only exception I make on that one is what I've seen, um, the most recent example at, at JCPC is this uh, talking about replacing some tiles in town hall with a different kind of tile that doesn't require toxic substances to be cleaned was brought up as a climate action and sustainability. So someone was thinking in terms of the substances we use, not just the materials. So in that staff is doing that, but some are not as actionable mm -hmm. as you know specific. So I think this exercise is a good one for us to do to get to a, a narrower group of where we want to put emphasis on in the coming year. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, most of most of what I was going to say has already been said, so I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, but I did have a question and that was we had two documents we were asked to fill out. The other one was a Word document, and I don't see that how that was reflected in what we had feedback on. So I was curious to know. It what... is, no, it's reflected in the page. So, for example, Andy, in um, Climate Action, one of your top five was goal one, sub goal three. Okay. That was one of your top five. So it got an X. Okay. Another one of yours was in your second five and it got a slant, one slant, and that was using the climate lens. It was just a way of trying to put everything on one sheet, which is, you know, I'm literally, I, <laughs> I laid awake, awake at night trying to figure out how to depict this back to people. So all of your feedback, except the written feedback, is here, okay? And whether it's useful or not, I think the most useful thing at this point is, in fact, to hear from Paul and David uh, and, Athena. and Athena. Although, I, 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 Athena, were you involved in these conversations? I think she's been too busy doing the budget. Um, but... Paul and David, uh, why don't we start with the climate action uh, goal and proceed? Thank you. So um, we did go through all these goals. We talked about it with our staff. And what we, I think we came to some of the similar conclusions that you did. Some of them, we're doing them. They're ongoing. Uh, they're, they're not going to, we didn't give them a priority because, you know, looking, using a climate lens to make decisions, we're doing that. Um, and I think what we're hoping is that you'll see that those kinds of actions reflected when we develop our budget and we identify those things in the budget process. The goal from my perspective is that the, the excuse me, council sets goals, the town manager receives those goals, incorporates them into the staffing plans, but also in the budget. You see the budget, you see are my goals reflected in the budget. And then those um, come out in the budget and then you evaluate me as to whether those goals have been delivered on. So um, how would you like us to move forward? We, what we And what we've done is we've sort of put a time frame in our, just a general time frame um, and where we would prioritize them in terms of when things could get done because yes. we've learned a lot over the last few uh, couple of years about how long things take and uh, we realize things take a long time mm -hmm. and it's a legislate, especially legislation. Um, and then we're trying, and these are rough things. And I think we, this is an iterative process. We really look forward to a conversation. If the council is saying, whoa, this really is something we want you to prioritize. We would then relocate some other work. Right. We want to emphasize that our staff have a lot of duties to do in addition to the goals that the council sets. So the council's, you know, we are building buildings. We are um, re reviewing uh, permits for new developments, for new buildings. Um, there's a lot of work that's being done on a regular basis. And we also recognize the importance of the council's goals to achieve things going forward. What I think that we've come to realize is that um, the council setting broad goals is crucially important. For instance, when you set a goal, since climate action is the first one, as a climate action goal, we have internalized that, as Kathy has mentioned, that people are thinking about that every time we look at products or purchase things or uh, um, 
come up with ideas on what we want to go to, you know, where we are seeking grants and things like that. But um, so I, I think that setting those big goals and then also saying we wouldn't, this council wants to accomplish these things this year, or I would actually think you should go to a two year goal setting time frame, but um, that's up to you in terms of how you want to set goals. Um, so. Um, oh, oh, could I? Yeah, go ahead. Is it possible yeah. for me to just jump in? Yes. I think that was a, an excellent summary. I think when Paul and I were thinking about this, we were really wanting to emphasize that this should be a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we want to hear from you. Obviously, some of the, the rankings help, but um, there's a lot here. There's in Paul's goals, and it can be a little overwhelming, I think, as we look at what can be accomplished between now and the end of uh, this calendar year. And I agree, it, it should be um, ultimately a two-year process. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, part of my job is to balance workload and workload. I'm only speaking really for conservation and development tonight, but my area, our functional area touches most other departments in town. So we work closely with the health department, the recreation department, the DPW, and the list goes on. And it really is that balancing act of, as Paul mentioned, kind of, uh, at least in C&D, the regulatory responsibilities that the planning board, zoning board, uh, DAAC, Conservation Commission, all of those boards and committees have, while at the same time working on goals of buildings and parks and, and the list goes on. You know, uh, I thought about Fort River School and Jones Library, and, you know, we are well on our way on both of those projects. But to some degree, the work of, as an example, inspection services is just beginning. They worked very closely with the building committee, the designers, the OPM on getting, let's take Fort River School, the wonderful event we had this week. But now inspection services takes over from this point forward, raking ground, moving dirt, uh, setting foundations, all of that work falls to Rob Mora and his team. All at the same time, we're hoping to launch rental registration, which has been in process for 18 months. So that's the kind of balancing act. I think that's a really, a real example for me and the staff that that does such wonderful work in C&D is, um, yes, we have a, a wonderful new school in process, but for inspection services, their sleeves are, are rolling up and wow, 24, 25 and beyond is gonna be a lot of work. While at the same time, we hope to launch if the council moves forward on rental registration. So just that's a really tangible example for us. So thank you. Looking forward to the conversation tonight and beyond. It'll, it'll this is just the start, I think. So we're gonna start with climate and just go down those initial. Thank you. So yes, and uh, what was really informative, I think it's actually your, your exercise that you've done. I haven't really memorized all the priorities but it, it, but but i think it was really <laughs> useful to sort of help us frame this a little bit so um and I'm, when, when when i call something ongoing i just sort of i'm not going to really address it it's ongoing like the first one is use climate lens i think that's ongoing it's a it's what we're doing uh the second one is the joint powers entity i think we have reported that that's on hold and that's a low prior very low priority because they're taking a different tack with the cca and that 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 is moving forward, but this particular goal is not one that will be a priority for the town staff. Um, the third one is you have two, and I was a little confused about how you ranked them because Thank there was you. the waste hauler bylaw and the solar bylaw, and I'm not sure how. I'm actually very curious how the councilors, you know, if you prioritize this, did you mean both? Did you mean one or the other? Because uh, this is important to us, um, and I think that. That's this is probably a crucial one for you to discuss mm -hmm. um, in terms of where your priority is. When we've looked at this um, for waste hauler, we think that that's about a twelve month process. Um, a the to get something up and ready um, and a proposal to the council. And I think what we would look to is get something. If there's going to be a new waste hauler bylaw, uh, we'd be optimistic about getting something prepared for a the budget discussion in FY twenty six. Um, for uh, the solar, uh, it's already been in process for what, 12 months, Dave? 18, 18, 18 months. months. But I think there's a long, I mean, knowing what we've gone through with rental registration, this is just now 
coming to the council, you're talking about a, a fairly substantial conversation about what this is going to look like. So I think we would say, you know, if, if the council is ready to initiate on this, I think the staff are prepared. Um, I don't think the council, the staff are necessarily prioritizing this as something that's urgent. Uh, and Dave can talk to us yeah. a little bit more if he'd like. I can jump in on, yeah, on that. Um, we had a very good conversation, I think, last night at CRC, a couple hour conversation on this. Um, I think Paul's category, you know, the way he, he characterized it is staff do not see this as urgent, but at the same time, staff and, and uh, the working group have invested 18 months in moving this forward. I think it was a very fruitful conversation last night about trying to uh, tease apart what is bylaw, what is regulation. And I think that's what CRC identified. That was a big takeaway for all of us, I think, last night from CRC. And I think once that is done, we'll have a better idea of how long might this take to move those parts through the CRC and, and hopefully make a recommendation to the council. So I think there's a commitment from staff. I know there's a commitment um, um, at some level from the council. I think what I heard last night from council members of uh, representatives on the CRC was you wanted to have a, or, or it might be helpful to have a conversation this evening about how high a priority that is. So I would defer to all of you as to how high a priority is that, and then staff can take that back. And I think last night I also talked about um, pacing ourselves on that. So I would defer to the chair of CRC or other members of CRC to fill us in on, on where you think that is in priorities. I'll address the next, the last two in this section. Uh, so the ensure the town can fully utilize state and federal funds targeted at sustainability initiatives. We see that as something that we're doing on a regular basis, but if, the, if we're misunderstanding that, we'd like to hear from the council, if, you know, the counselors who really felt this was important. Um, we just feel like that's a get, yes, we're always doing that. We're looking for funds, but if there's something that someone says, no, here's what I really had in mind for you to do, um, we'd like to know that. And then the uh, last one is to take action on the portions of the, of the CARP that have been prioritized. And I think that that's, again, something that's on our, what that says to me is that we could give you an update on all where we are on the CARP. And I think that might be a, an important conversation or to report to you on what we have prioritized, what's working on that. Okay. So let's pause here for a moment. Is there anybody who wants to discuss one or two? Kathy, one or two? Sub goals, one or two. Okay, then let's go on to three, where I also tell you I wanted to split this in half. Um, Andy. Yeah, just in general terms, the way that I was ranking the highest may have not been what everybody else was doing, but I was looking at it from what is the highest priority for the council, recognizing that staff are working on these goals, but they have may have different sense of what are the highest priorities and uh, they're working on things where they have the opportunity to get success. I'm looking for what is involved for the council and development of bylaws, therefore ranked um, extremely high because they're bylaws that have been discussed. They've been, a lot of time has been spent on them and uh, bringing those bylaws to a conclusion becomes therefore, in my mind, a high priority for the council. Um, so I'm speaking in my role as a counselor. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I'm gonna speak to the solar bylaw and I understand there was quite a conversation at CRC last night. I look forward to hearing more about that, although I've heard from some people today to me, the issue of the solar bylaw goes back to um, its origination and the fact that we have had a group work on it, whether it's regulation or not. I also re uh, reflect on the fact that the chair of the ZBA suggested we needed this. But more importantly, we need something where we can stand up to the state and say, we control our own land. 
That does not mean we don't support solar. It just means I personally and many people I know in Amherst do not want the state coming in and saying, thou shalt do this to your land. It's our land. It's not. I, 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 we have discussed this with our legislators and it is an ongoing issue. And while I totally support the establishment of solar, I want to do it in a way that protects our land and the safety of our residents. Um, Councilor Walker. Um, thank you, Lynn. I'm just having a bit of a hard time with this conversation because I'm trying to understand what our goal is here because I know, like, I prioritize, I submitted my priorities for our goals, but these are already all of our goals. So like, are we trying to change what our goals are as a council? Were we just trying to determine what our priorities are, but does that change anything because they're all still generally our goals? So are we saying these goals are more important than these goals? Is that like a definitive determination we're making it making right now? Because I thought that the 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 ranking was just for purposes of the conversation we'd be having tonight but if we're not using the rankings for our conversation i'm just trying to understand like what are we trying to get out of this conversation what we're trying to get out of this conversation is the prioritization of our sub goals within our goals so it's not to say climate action is more important than this but within climate action where do we see things importantly but when we are doing like the town manager evaluation, and I know Anna said like we're re-looking re at that process, but typically we go through each one of these things and make notes as to like what progress we think we've made throughout the year on each goal. So does prioritizing these goals help us at all? Or are we just trying to tell the town manager, we hope you do these things first? It was a discussion that was back and forth between what goals are most important over say a two year period and what can we reasonably expect to happen? And that's one of the reasons why, for instance, um, uh, Paul and Dave have already said the uh, development of a, a waste hauler bylaw is probably a 12 month process. And the first time we would see anything in the budget would be FY26 a year from now. So it's, an iterative process. Like if, if this is a goal, let's make sure we understand when we can accomplish it and what it's going to take to accomplish it. And later on, we may hear some additional things that, you know, are clearly around what do we need in the way of money to accomplish that. So it's, it's really an opportunity to go back and forth and understand what's behind each of the goals and therefore what is our priority. Does that help, Alicia? Slightly, but is it okay if I just have a follow-up? Because mm -hmm. the way I'm looking at it, even if we say that that's a 12-month pro process to see it in the budget, there are still steps that should be taken during those 12 months to get to the point of us seeing it in the budget. So would we not still be looking at, are we taking the necessary steps to be able to see this in 12 months? And that's how we measure this goal. But that doesn't really change the priority level of the goal, it just changes how we measure the progress of the goal. It, it does. And so, for example, when the town manager then submits his self-evaluation, if in this conversation we've already understood that the most progress we can help to make on waste hauler is X, then that's what we should expect to see. Not, in other words, it's not going to all get completed by the time we do his self, he does his self evaluation uh, this fall. It gives us a sense of timing as well as expectations. And in some instances, I think you're going to hear the question: What does success look like in this? What, what do? We, how would we measure this? So mm -hmm. a lot of this is not as cut and dry as we would like it. And I think all of us felt that when we were trying to fill this in. Sorry, just one last thing. And so I think that 
Cause I also had the same experience of like really having a hard time reading them because a lot of them were overlapping and some things I think are equally as important. So that was really hard. But I think that this conversation for me at least is leaning more towards like, this is a conversation we should have had before we determined what our goals were. And so again, like a process thing, like we should have done this a little bit earlier because now, even if we say only this can happen, we can't change what the goal is. So this is the goal as it's going to read. I, that's why I believe someone in the beginning said it would be good to do this before we finalize our goals. Kathy, I credit you with that. Yeah. So I'll yeah. say it again. It Absolutely. Alicia, it would be good to it first. I mean, this is a good one to focus on because way back when, when I saw the goals, I said, I haven't seen ways taller. I don't know how strong I want to push it because I want to know whether it costs the town a lot of money to do it, whether it's going to toss the taxpayers more and do we have the staff to do it? So I had a question mark and to make it a town manager goal, I thought before we'd had it's been in subcommittee. So I know there's been a lot of work on it, but I haven't seen it because I've not been on that committee. So so that was my, and on solar, we had a lot of discussion on this and this would move to a bylaw. So I feel differently about the two of these, but I left it blank because I didn't know how to rank something where one of them I had questioned from the very beginning that if we haven't decided to do it, we shouldn't tell the town manager it's a top priority. So I wanted the decision to have a 13 person discussion about it first. So this one has two parts to it. Where on solar, we had a pretty robust discussion on what we hope to get out of the committee. And I haven't, I know I should have seen what came back, but I haven't paid attention to it. So I'm ready. So it's it's a good one. Um, and I think, Alicia, you're right. This is an exercise we should be doing first rather than saying we gave you these goals, but it's a two-year goal or it's a three-year goal. It's not as important as A, B, or C. Okay. Uh, Councilor Haneke. So <clears throat> I ranked this one low. Um, um, <laughs> um, I agree with Kathy on waist taller. Um, I'm not sure we should be having staff spend a lot of time on something we don't know whether we'd adopt or haven't had a good conversation of if this costs more money, are we still going forward with it? You know, that that doesn't mean we're not necessarily for looking at things, but but I think we're missing parts of that conversation. Um, for solar, I look at who needs to do the work on the staff and that is our planning department. and. Frankly, I just have higher priorities in different areas for planning department than the solar bylaw, especially when the planning department says they don't think this is a priority compared to other things. So that's one of, not compared to other things, but but they said that our current bylaw um, could potentially manage this. Um, I would like to see our planning department focus on measures related to economic development and housing before solar. Um, especially having seen the draft solar bylaw and believe that it has a lot of issues. Um, solar bylaws are still in major upheaval across the state. Um, but there's also the other potential bylaws. We're only focused on two, but there might be other bylaws out there that would better focus climate action than these two um, that we're not even having a discussion on or asking staff about or giving them their own thoughts about what that is. And then the other thing I wanted to push back on is I actually want to just put out there that I disagree with Lynn um, regarding her advocacy to the state about, I think her quote was, we can, we control our own land. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree with that. Um, this is where we're seeing the solar bylaws, but heads with 40H chapter 40A, section three of not regulating. And if every town is left to their own saying we support having solar and moving to non-fossil fuels, but letting every town regulate no large scale, we're not gonna move there. 
I, just like with housing and affordable housing, and we say it's a regional issue, solar is also a regional issue. So I just needed to put that out there so it didn't stand alone. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Uh, yes, yeah, so as one of the, uh, well, I guess now we're three, uh, one of the three council sponsors of the waste hauler bylaw, um, we, I would, that was voted out of the council, refer that to TSO. Um, there are many community members um, for whom it's a high priority. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow on the uh, TSO agenda, after mm -hmm. um, many months, we are seeing a report, a request for information went out um, last summer um, and for information on pricing and services uh, that will be that was received in October and then TSO will see the report for the first time tomorrow. So it is moving along, but we, we can't be starting with the information we'll, we'll see tomorrow. We'll begin to have some idea of what the services that we can obtain are that are out there. Um, and just, you know, and some more information on pricing. At um, an MMA session in January, we there was a session on um, towns contracting themselves for waste hauler services. And they said, absolutely, when you, the fee structure, the pay as you throw fee structure in town after town, they have seen that that very much reduces, uh, it's, it's a very good waste reduction strategy and that that is um, something that's you know important among our climate action goals. So I hope we can continue to move forward with the waste hauler and um, you know under, we totally I think the sponsors understand that this will take time, but I hope that we can continue to move forward with it. Pam. Ooh, thank you. I wanted to speak to the solar, which is the other half of the of number three um, in our meeting. The staff did not say that solar is not a priority. They, she said that it was not urgent because there were no proposals coming in that they were aware of beyond what was already in hand. Um, and that it takes quite a while to get organized so that we would be aware of new projects coming in. Um, I think what Lynn was referring to for the state is that they are making an effort to collect information and propose um, streamlining processes for solar regulation and permitting, and that um, there would be something like, you know, sort of the state EPA would manage or DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, might manage some process of that sort. And I would concur with Lynn that I think it's important for us to get our ducks in a row and to understand what is of of key interest to Amherst in terms of a balance between the solar and the working lands or the working forests um, in a way that um, kind of gives us a win-win. So I don't I don't want to cut off that conversation and I would put it in fact it was my it was my number one priority. So um, I'd love to see that conversation going forward. Andy? Yeah, I'm going to start with waste hauler, but it's really what I'm going to say is going to have a broader uh, cover than that. Uh, waste hauler is something that we've had as a discussion in this town for a long time, going back to before this form of government when there was a refuse and recycling management committee that developed a long-term strategic plan. And what the bylaw is doing, and it's sort of that uh, committee has morphed into an independent organization, uh, Zero Waste Amherst, but it is the same set of priorities. And it is the same set of priorities that was very clearly stated at that MMA conference session, uh, which um, was gratifying because it really did put flesh on the bow on, on the bones of what it is that are the reasons that you would have a plan like that. And uh, it is also consistent with the state, which has its own plan. And uh, so that the state is mandate is going to be mandating that communities move in this direction. So there, there are lots of reasons to do it. 
but ultimately for that bylaw and any other bylaw, you, we have to look at what is feasible, what our goals are, what is feasible, and then when we develop a plan, we have to step back and make a decision as to whether it can be implemented, whether what are the economics of uh, the costs and benefits of implementing the plan. So whether it be rental registration or be waste hauler, um, we can't make that judgment until we have uh, developed the bylaw to at least as far left along that we can assess what are the benefits and what are the costs, uh, because that's ultimately what the council's judgment ought to be. Pat? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll try to keep this lean. Uh, the solar bylaw uh, is a critical uh, piece of legislation. Uh, it may not be urgent because we've had a group of people working on it for over a year. There was work on it done before that um, and offered to both the planning board and the ZBA via the moratorium. So that's something that we've been working on for quite a while. The other thing is that the projects that are in the works, there are real critical issues going on with them. Uh, uh, Pure Sky and the forested land off Shootsbury Road and other forested land here, uh, that could very much affect water because all of those households are on wells. So we really need to think about what we're doing and how we're let, you know, what our uh, guidelines and boundaries are. The other thing, the Hickory Ridge project, they've included battery storage. That's a project or that it, this one actually does feel urgent to me, which makes this whole thing urgent. That there, there's a consistent flooding on that site now, and I said this in the meeting, there uh, limits access. Water has damaged battery storage units and caused fires that, that literally the leakage has caused the chemical action so that they explode and burn. And with the flooding at Hickory Ridge, it would be almost impossible to get emergency vehicles there. So it is, there's a level of urgency but there's also, we can take good steps because we do have to keep aware of what the Attorney General's office is allowing because they're making shifts and also the shifts that the state have made around preserving forests and the, the, really, the need for that for because of the sequestration thing. So we need to keep working on it, pulling it apart, regs and bylaw, great idea needs to happen. There are a lot of good things in the bylaw pieces. So I don't think it's gonna be this overwhelming, incredible project that is gonna take so much staff time. Uh, CRC is gonna to need to come up with an understanding of the issue. And, and we really need to pay attention, and I'm saying this for myself, to people who um, have differing opinions because I would like us to find a really collaborative solution to this. But the health, safety, and welfare of many of our residents is at stake with just two potential projects right now in town. And there are other things we can look at to do solar. Enough said. That wasn't lean. Sorry. Jennifer? Yeah, just quickly. Um, no, I just hope that I'm getting concerned that, you know, that we'll have uh, patience with each other and the process, because I feel it's a little like, well, waste hauler has been kind of you know, there for over a year, so do we still want to keep it a priority? But since there, many of these take a long time to go from being referred to a committee to actually being a bylaw that I hope can be patient. And part of the reason they take time is we understand staff and committees have many things going, um, priorities competing or not competing, but happening that have to happen at the same time. So I hope we can just be patient. And even if things seem to be moving along slowly, that we won't say, oh, you know, we're going to bump it off. We have another priority. And then all the time that's been put into it, you know, for a year, 18 months was for not. <laughs> um, so the next one, as the town manager said, is kind of ongoing. And, you know, whenever we find funds, we actually do a very good job of going after them in Amherst. Um, 
And then the other one is the climate action and we provide regular updates. So I just want to pause for a moment before, I'm sorry, um, Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Paul whether he has the resources to go after every potential mm -hmm. uh, Thank federal, Thank state you. and federal funds. Because if he doesn't have the resources, then we can't do that. We can't meet that goal. Paul? Um, we, um, we could always use more resources. Um, the, you know, we have a, 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 are using ARPA funds. We have a capital projects manager who's been working on the school and the library among other projects as well. Um, he's, I, he has educated himself about uh, a lot of the, um, resources out there, especially the IRA, um, his tenure with the town. Well, we're, we're going to keep trying to keep him engaged on different projects. So, um, we probably would have to engage some consultants to help us with some of this stuff. And I think there are people out there who are developing expertise in this, um, including um, consulting firms, but also legal firms as well. So we probably have to add, add, allocate some funds to really set us up in the right direction, especially for the bigger projects. Anna? What Paul just said is exactly why this was one of my higher ranked goals. Um, we need to, the town manager goals feed into the budget guideline. Everything feeds each other, right? Um, this is a big ecosystem of what we're going to try to hopefully get done. Um, and for me, this, this question is a matter of, do we have the resources? Are we allocating the resources necessary in order to be able to pursue these things? And for the town manager, that resource might be staff time. It includes staff time. And then the council is saying in putting something like this in the town manager goals that we are going to also back it up in our budget guidelines and that we want to see it in the budget that someone like our capital projects manager is able to do this exact thing as part of his role. So um, this is one where there, it's a really vague and opaque goal on paper. and it's one where I go back and forth because I don't know that the council is in Athena and I've had many conversations about this, that, um, because I struggle with, with where the council is overstepping in putting some of these goals on paper and where we're not. Um, and so keeping this vague, we still need a way to communicate what this means to us without necessarily assigning it to be done in one specific way. Um, but yeah, the least lean comment, sorry. I, I went well, rogue. And there's there's another side to going after money. And that is once you get it, you need to be able to manage it. And I've heard from time to time that not only is it tough to put the staff on for writing the proposals, but then when you get them, you know, you have somebody committed 150% FTE and I'm going to excuse me we don't have 150% FTE for that. So um, uh, full-time equivalent, I'm sorry. I shouldn't use acronyms like that. Um, Could I jump in for yeah. a second, Lynn? So, no, I think this is a very interesting conversation. Um, to Paul's point, sure, you know, could we use more staff to, to, to chase grants and chase funding and administer that funding and carry out project manage? Absolutely, I, I think who would turn that down? But I do want to kind of dispel the myth from time to time. I do hear at certain meetings that, you know, someone says, well, why didn't we go after Grant X or Grant Y? And I will tell you, we have a very, uh, our staff is very aggressive about going after funding. Yeah. We have literally some millions of dollars in the pipeline right now not even withstanding ARPA money and CPA money. And so to Lynn's last point about, we then need to manage that money, manage those projects, manage those contracts. Um, those are all things we do. It's great to get the grant. It's great to get the, the check in Boston or wherever we get it here in town, but how do we manage the projects once we get it? So we go after every dollar we think um, makes sense. We do. Uh, after serious discussions, sometimes pass on some things for very good reasons. This week alone, I've had some 
interesting conversations with community members about um, uh, uh, municipal vulnerability uh, program dollars. And in fact, the town has gotten a couple of NVP grants in the last few years, but there's a couple of projects that we floated with the state and the state said they just didn't think those were fundable. So we made the decision not to invest hours and hours of staff time to write those grants. It doesn't make everyone happy. And sometimes people question, why did we do that? But that's the reality. Um, but we're, you know, Northampton and Amherst, we kind of, um, you know, kind of bounce off each other, challenge each other. I mean, we get a lot of funding on this side of the river. Northampton does as well. But I just want to say we go after the funding in all departments. So uh, there are times when I have conversations with our superintendent of public works and we, you know, Guilford might say, are you going for that, Dave? Or are you folks going to go? Let's team up. Let's put our, our staff together. Jason Skeels and Stephanie Ciccarello and Aaron Jock and, and Nate Malloy and say, let's go for that money. So we we are aggressive about going for funding at the state and federal level in all categories, housing, you know, uh, mass works, et cetera. So, but there is a limit to how much we can manage once it gets here. Okay. Uh, then to any comments at this point on number five, take action on the portions of the climate action CARP. So let me just pause for a moment. I wanna make sure that we are not here till midnight. I'm not gonna be here till midnight. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, Anna's already told me she's walking out at 10, so. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd like to use that as a goal. Uh, but when you look at our discussion here tonight, number one, we've said is kind of ongoing. Should we spend time ranking that or not? I'm not asking you to answer the question right now. Number two, looks at this point like it's a no-go. It's We're not going this way. Somebody else is not going this way. Number three, on the other hand, we feel like we need to split into two or three parts. Number four, there's a nuance with it that isn't actually in the statement. And that's the issue of staffing to go for it and staffing to make it happen once you get the money. And then on number five, it's, you know, some people spent enormous amounts of time putting together a huge and very important uh, climate action adaptation and resilience plan for Amherst, not unlike comprehensive housing. And it's a guidebook. How do we rank that? We certainly don't want to lose it. I'm just throwing this out so that as we think about how we rank goals down the road and how we think about how we write goals down the road. Like maybe it's, we do this goal by doing this, or in addition to this goal, this is some of the ways in which we could get there. Just to, before we, with that, let's move on to uh, community health and safety. Yeah, Pam. Can you, can you give us just like a real quick summary of what we do with the information that we just talked about? Do we give it our own personal rankings of the very most top priority on this sheet? And somehow we're gonna relay that to you later or do we just keep talking till 10 o'clock? No, I assume we're going to um, have another round of some kind of input. I'm trying to visualize what that looks like, and I know other people are too, but it will not be done by the time we finish tonight. Okay. okay. That's, that's tonight's very good to time. Thank you. Yeah. Gather I just a didn't lot know what the end result was trying to be. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. Health, community health and safety. There's five. Um, any comments before we ask the town manager and assistant town manager to discuss? See none, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the first one is facilitate the implementation of the residential rental bylaw. Um, that one we're prepared to move forward on. We have laid out what it would take to implement. We know it would take probably 
six to nine months to actually implement with the expectation that we could um, have something in place with staff hired by the end of the calendar year with the first inspections likely to happen in January of 2025. It doesn't have to, the implementation does not have to be tied to a fiscal year as long as funds are in place. So once the council acts on this, then we know what we, we, I think we've shared previously with you what the implementation would look like. And just to pause for a moment, this will be on the agenda for the first reading on April 1st and the second reading and vote if it all goes as it might, is April 8th. Mm -hmm. And that gives the manager time to make sure that it's in the budget. Okay? Yep. Uh, um, the second one is the continue the implementation and assessment of the community's responders, the CREST program, the CREST department. So I think there's two pieces to that. We're continuing, this, it's a multi-year effort to get the CREST department up and running. We're making good progress. As you know, the new director will start on April 8th. Um, the implement the assessment is the piece that we're also working on. And there's been some work done by the interim leadership team, um, but we sort of hit a, a, a slowdown on that, but that's an important piece of it. But I just want to communicate to you that this is a long-term investment by the town that we continue to invest in to get it up and running. It's not good. You're not going to know in, in three years whether it's working or not. It's going to take multiple years to de develop a new department. I think we have the same kind of situation with the uh, resident inspection services with the residential bylaw. It's going to take time to build it up and to establish it in the in the in the community. But we're committed to that, and that's being funded. Uh, the third is the proposed to the town council plan for the creation of the resident oversight board. Um, this is something that is a priority for the DEI. Um, we've have a so so it's in progress process. Uh, the our RFP was issued and uh, for um, a consultant to do the next phase of the development of the uh, re of the resident oversight board. Those are due on April 9th. Um, we think that the, uh, the DI director feels like this, the new, the board would could be operational early in fiscal, and uh, in, in early in fiscal 25. Um, it'll take about 120 days uh, to move it towards where it needs to go. So, um, so I think that's a this calendar year thing. Resources are available. It's just going through the processes now. So I think that's a that's been a priority for the council um, and for the town. So that's that's in place. The third one is undertake a review of the public safety protocols consistent with the council's November 14, 2022 vote. That's looking at police policies, and that's something we've uh, consistently told you we will wait till the new chief is hired. So I think that that's will be one of the first. Uh, a top priority for the two new chief when he we have two finalists so they're both him men so it's it's when he when he gets uh, appointed uh develop program for, for youth empowerment so this is one where we have a set, a set aside uh, arpa funds and we've had the recreation department working um on different programs and i can get a more thorough update on that it's something that they um uh, are working on and continue to develop and offering new programs, in fact. Is there anything you want to add on any of those, Dave? It takes a minute. Um, perhaps I'll wait till the questions, okay. if, if there are any on that. Sure. Okay. Questions and comments? Um, I do have one, um, and that is, I assume there's some action that the council will have to take to form the resident oversight board. Is that correct? Yes. It's not unlike, for instance, when we approve the board of license commissioners. Okay. Well, you didn't approve the board of license That's commissioners. That's true, we didn't. That was we, in the charter. That was charter. But we would, we would come to you with a... I don't know if it's going to be a, assuming it's a bylaw. I think we're going to have to have some teeth in it. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Walker. Um, I was just also wondering, you said um, it will take 120 days for the resident oversight board, which just sounds really specific. So I was hoping you might elaborate more on why or where that comes, where is that, that is coming from. Yeah. So, so some people talk in months and that's what we've been saying before. Um, 
this the information I received was I think that really is meaning four months. Um, I could have said four months more likely. Um, so that's what, some people put it in sixty to one hundred twenty one day one hundred twenty days versus you know two to four months. That's the only reason I put it in days. It's not that specific. I shouldn't have made it that specific. But the feedback you got on that came from the DEI department. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Does that answer your question, Alicia? Yeah, I just wasn't sure if there was like a specific mandate that we had to wait this amount of time for some certain reason. So that was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Kathy? Um, yeah, Paul, on resident oversight board and maybe youth empowerment, um, on the first, I've never quite understood whether there's a staff implication in terms of staff hours, if we have one of those. And I think it would be really good if the council itself knew that requires more staffing, you know, what, when we're saying we like the idea. On programming for youth empowerment, a similar question, you know, on is the money for running programs, is the money for a physical location, when does it run out? And I don't need answers for this right now, but I think is what Dave's point about juggling people's time, that if the same people are doing multiple things that we have on a priority list, um, or we need more people on climate, I didn't speak up because Bob already said what I had said, that I, I know how much time the person we have paid by ORPA money is figuring out how to get the federal money for our, for our solar installations. So, and sometimes we have to invest in staff to get money, but sometimes if we do a program, it requires more staff. Mm -hmm. And I know the rental registration, we've, we've seen staff numbers for that. And we're trying to figure out if the revenue would cover the staffs. So in this whole bucket of things, Crest, we have staff, but I'd like some sense from you, not right now, on the staffing implications? Sure. No, I think those are good questions. Um, I'm referencing the Resident Oversight Board. We have ARPA funds dedicated to the development and uh, establishment of it. There will be ongoing costs in terms of stipends for the members of the Resident Oversight Board. Um, right now, we anticipate that existing staff can uh, uh, support the Resident Oversight Board, but if we get a lot of action, then it might become something different. But I can put together what our projected costs might look like over time. Are there any other questions or comments on this one before we go to the next? Um, okay, the next one's economic vitality. There's four sub goals. Um, any questions before we move to the discussion with the with the town manager, assistant town manager? Uh, not go ahead. So this, the first one is work closely with local institutions and businesses entities, business entities to promote diverse neighborhoods, affordable housing, new growth in downtown and village centers. So this, this is a broadly stated goal. And um, <laughs> we are looking at this in many different ways on how to meet it. Many of the things are things that we're already doing. So if I were to report to you on this goal today, I would say, here's what we're doing. If the one of the questions for you, the council, is that if you had something in mind specifically that you would like to see happen, that would what the success look like? The answer to so what what the success look like question, um, that, that would be helpful for us tonight. Um, review and revise town regulations to reduce barriers to operating a business in in Amherst. Um, I think this is one. There's a couple different responses to this, um, but I think the primary one is that. Um, this is something we would be looking at working on during the summer um, with dedicating some of our economic development ARPA funds to um, bringing in someone to help us evaluate our processes. So I think we would look at this as a summer type of um, project. Um, proposed revisions to the zoning bylaws to increase and support economic development throughout the town. Um, Dave can speak to the work that's being done at the planning department on some of these things. Um, and um, in terms of um, 
how long things are going to take or when we can start them. We can be more specific if you want to talk about that. Um, and then revise, review and revise policies to support increased year round population in town. I don't really know what I would, what, what that looks like to you in terms of what does that look, what would be something that you would expect? Here's what, here's what I want you, here's what I would expect you to show on, on my town manager report on that this has been accomplished. That's it. Um, I'm going to ask. It, can I ask Dave if he wants Please, to Please, David, go, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. I, I can elaborate a little bit on on kind of one through one through four or so. Um, and a lot of these, you know, touch on other other topics, you know, like housing and ma major capital projects. But, you know, under number one, just thinking about the the range and, and kind of diverse number of projects that that our staff are working on with private developers in our village centers right in downtown. Some of you know some of these projects. They're they're beginning to to make their way through the permitting processes here. We've heard quite a bit about uh, South Pleasant Street and the Hastings block, some of the ideas that are uh, percolating there through local development, uh, expanding housing stock, et cetera. Um, Amity Street and U Drive, um, we have uh, local developers looking at some very creative options for uh, down in that region of town. Also, the planning board uh, really focused for the, for the last number of months on an overlay district there um, with a focus on increased density for uh, housing and also residential, um, uh, uh, broadening our residential numbers. Um, also, we're, our staff is uh, looking at uh, the East Village. We have a new wonderful school going in, in the East Village. Wayfinders, as you know, will be uh, coming before regulatory boards this summer and fall with a 78 unit uh, uh, proposal that uh, we are partnering with them on at the East Street School in Belchertown Road. We're working with other developers down in the East Village to really look at redevelopment. So there's a number of those kinds of initiatives that are going on. Um, in terms of Paul mentioned, uh, you know, focusing on our kind of reviewing and revising our town regulations um, I guess the emphasis I would put there is that there's regulations um, and there's there's our processes that staff work with developers, work with homeowners, work with folks coming through processes for new restaurants, for instance, things like that. But then there's also constant work on, you know, some of the things we talked about with zoning. So how difficult is it and how long does it take to get through a regulatory process here in town. So those are kind of ongoing things that we're always looking at. Um, let's see, zoning bylaws. Um, I would just highlight a couple, obviously the uh, University Drive, the housing and economic development overlay. Um, we're also looking at uh, East Village and then we're also looking at temporary use. I know the board uh, in, you know, during COVID coming out of COVID, really look creatively at kind of temporary use. What, what could happen downtown with, with uh, uh, Business X wanting to use a parking lot for food trucks or, or um, a farm wanting to do value-added um, um, uh, activities like weddings, like teaming up with a microbrewery to have something like that. All of those things um, can can broaden opportunities for all, all types of businesses in town. So I know that our building commissioner, our planning director and staff are looking at those. I think I'll stop there okay. for now. Kathy, you have your hand up. Um, I just want to thank Dave for what he just went through because I thought one of the things when you, I think when you look at this list and then you look at the next list, wherever housing comes in, they interrelate and they overlap a lot. So he just went through a long list of impressive housing developments that are happening that are quite diverse. And I, I do think the effort on University Drive is very interesting, you know, to, to look at a particular place. So I, I just think we have, we have to, as I'll echo something I said, even when I was reviewing these, we have to be more careful when we write these subcategories, because if if they're sort of saying the same thing with different words, we should just avoid that. 
you know, if they're really distinctive, if we have something specific in mind, then we should be more specific. But number one alone is a very nice, broad, <laughs> get stuff going wherever you can. <laughs> that says vitality, but it, it also talks about housing. Um, and housing is in the next one. So, so, so my overall ranking was trying to pick something on what, where I thought housing had the best chance. Jennifer. Yeah, well, I, um, I guess I maybe Paul or asked um, in terms of, yeah, I'm sorry, in terms of um, number four, um, review and revise policies to support increased uh, year round population in town. I mean, I sometimes think of that as like using a, a climate lens is under climate action goals. You know, that that's kind of a general lens in our policies or bylaws helping to support that or work against it. And I mean, what comes to mind is if we adopt the nuisance bylaw, that would be one way of, of supporting that. Um, even the university uh, drive overlay district could, if it takes less you know, pressure off some of the single family houses converting to rentals for students um, and could be rentals for you know, non-student households. Um, uh, I was gonna say, I also, think ways that if we support, you know, certainly um, build, you know, uh, the projects with Wayfair, East Street School, Belchertown Road, Ball Lane, that's all helping to uh, sustain and expand our uh, year-round population. Um, and even, I guess, supporting the Amherst uh, Community Land Trust. I mean, one that comes to mind to be really specific, um, uh, McClellan Street in District 4, uh, that is mostly uh, rental houses for students between Kendrick Park and Beston Street, but from Beston to Lincoln, it's been a, you know, 250-year-old, 200-year-old um, residential neighborhood. And a house went up for sale, a small house on a large lot, and uh, it... Um, I immediately, when it went up for sale, contacted the Amherst Community Land Trust, and they very quickly, the house, the open house was on a Saturday. They said they were accepting bids until that Wednesday at the end of the day, so they were, you know, clearly looking for um, a developer to purchase it. The land trust tried to get um, financing together. They actually put in a bid, and they were hoping to, you know, I think their long-term um, goal was to work with uh, Habitat for Humanity to build two houses for year-round households, but they um, had contingencies on the offer, and it went to a developer who made an all-cash offer. And it was actually about $350,000, so that's under the median price that housed. I mean, it would have been perfect for the land trust, but it's hard to compete with an all-cash offer. So I think anything we can do to try and help a land trust or help you know, to have retained that property um, and then a house two doors down uh, is is now going, the people want to move out and convert it to a rental in part because of what they expect is going to happen next door. So that's, um, I'm, I didn't mean to digress and go into that detail, but I mean, anything we can do to try and help like a land trust or to be able to develop housing for our long-term population. Lynn, could I just add three other quick things? Again, these these kind of cross categories, but just to mention to the to the uh, council, um, you know, I think Paul has mentioned that we're very interested, we're committed with the university, with some of our local development partners to uh, submit a Mass Works grant for Amity Street. And this is more than, our goal is for more than a roundabout roundabout is wonderful it will move it will move cars it will safely bring pedestrians and and uh, uh, cyclists to the university to university drive businesses but we also want to go south on university drive to see what else a mass works grant can unlock so it's more than this is part of the planning board's vision for unlocking some development in an appropriate place which I think many of us believe is um, uh, you drive university drive other things we're doing, you know, working, you know, DPW has an initiative right now with some funding through CPA to uh, look at the War Memorial area, of War Memorial Pool. So we're talking about building community, building uh, neighborhood um, uh, vitality. So we're looking at 
how do we redo the um, bathhouse and the surrounding area around War Memorial Pool to make that a vibrant, active space for children, families, uh, just like Kendrick Park? How many of us seven, eight, nine years ago when that visioning process was going on would say, well, a playground in Kendrick Park, what's that going to do? It has activated a space that really was quite quiet and, and not very useful in many ways. Um, so things like that. I also forgot to mention one initiative that the planning department has already uh, launched, which is um, looking at the downtown design and streetscape um, uh, guidelines. And this is, we've heard from the community, we've heard from the council um, that that is a high priority. And so um, we uh, have a consultant on board and, and the public process for that effort will be launched very shortly. So that's ongoing. That's going to take many months to do. I presume many of you will be involved in that effort. So how do we get more clarity about what we would like to see in downtown businesses, in our facades, in our streetscapes, et cetera, downtown? So lot, I could keep going. There's a long list. But I just want to give you a, a quick smattering of what we're working on. Okay. Mandy Jo? Um, I'm going to veer from what I was going to say for a little bit because of what Dave just said. For War Memorial, I encourage teen use. There's a playground for preteens, children, a block away, a block mm -hmm. and a half away at Kendrick. So I would really want this, the departments and all the planning to make sure there is stuff for teens to do at War Memorial play-wise hanging out wise, um, skate park, what fine stuff. Um, it's right next to the, the schools and all, it would be a perfect place for teen uses. Um, but that's not what I wanted to concentrate. On. Um, what struck me in this one is item number two, sub goal review and revise town regulations to reduce barriers to operating businesses in Amherst, um, four, five, six, eight of 13 counselors put it in their top 10 sub goal overall list. And I think that is extremely important. There are only five sub goals that more than a, ma a majority or more counselors put in their top 10. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. Three of them all relate to the fire in DPW. That should tell you something when we get there. <laughs> but so there's only two others and this is one of them. And so I think we cannot ignore the fact that this council wants to see the regulations and the barriers to actually opening businesses and operating businesses substantially reduced, whether that's how much time it takes to permit, whether that's bylaws that reduce what the permitting um, requirements are, whatever it is, we want to see it. And I think this shows that's where some of the department staff time needs to be spent. Bob? Yeah, I wanna echo that sentiment. Um, the reason I put down uh, number two as number one and in, in the, um, the top 10 is I've spoken to a couple of people who have a, a business in Amherst and a business in Northampton. And they said, started getting started in Amherst was like pulling teeth getting started in Northampton was simple. So we're doing something wrong and we need to figure out what we're doing wrong. That's, that's you know, discouraging people from opening up businesses. I, it's more, I think, opening than operating. Although again, expanding businesses is very difficult as well. Yeah. Um, Freke, I'm sorry, Councillor Ette. When I read, excuse me, it's when I read um, number one. Is your mic on? Thank you. Is this better? Better? Yes. <laughs> I'm a little scared of. Okay. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what I wanted to say is that when I read number one, the obvious response was about housing, but 
that is being treated somewhere else. And so I was thinking that the focus is actually more on um, how the town is working to get um, businesses here to diversify the business base. And so I'm just wondering if um, the town has made a sufficient effort to um, encourage businesses or at least business ideas from the university and from Amherst College. These are world-class institutions, intellectual property, um, and perhaps there's a space that could be tapped um, from those uh, entities. Okay. At this point, well, it's a great question. I don't see anybody for jumping to answer it for the moment. Um, I'm sorry, George Ryan. So four always puzzled me, and I mentioned that back when we talked about this in January. But I think it's a little clear in my head today. I'm asking myself, what's the what's the problem this is supposed to be uh, that lies behind this? What's the issue? And when I think of it, I think of rental conversions, rental conversions. In other words, houses that are flipping from home ownership to rentals. Certainly something I heard a lot about while I was campaigning. It's something that other councils have talked about in the past. I'm not completely one, one way or the other, but I have tried over the years myself to try and get a handle on just what is the problem, get some data. So one question is, can we actually get some data about this issue? The second then is, can we think about what possibly could be done, assuming the data shows that there's a problem? It's all anecdotal. You talk to somebody who just has a house that's home owner occupied, flips to a student, it's the end of the world. But if the reverse happens, silence. So I think this is an issue that certainly I've heard a lot about. Could we look into it at some point? How would we do it? I tried to get data. I still keep trying to get data um, about this issue and then see where it would take us. Second thing quickly, um, love what I'm hearing from Dave. Just, I would say, we would be saying to staff and to, to Paul, keep talking to partnering with and working with UMass and with Amherst College in the area of economic development and housing. Just constant, constant, constant. Sounds like that's what you're doing. I know some talks are going on with Amherst College, but please, that, that's the other elephant in the room is our, our educational institutions and our relationship with them and partnering with them for these areas of economic development and housing. Um, okay, uh, and Pam, we're gonna thank you. I'm gonna build on what George just said and um, Councillor Ette, and that is again working with UMass. Just for instance, um, because the first comment was that number one was very was very broad, and do do we have any specifics? A number of years ago, there was the off-campus meal plan, which allowed folks to come in and spend dollar dining dollars in downtown restaurants. I don't know if it was successful. I think it was probably halted at the request of UMass because it drained money out of their dining halls and allowed folks to to come downtown and and eat. That's an that's I think is a really good example of where that needs that kind of thing needs to be re reestablished um, because so much of be, because so much has been drawn into the university internally rather than um, encouraging and, and forcing them to be more outward facing. Paul? Thank you. So I think I had the same, um, looking at your rankings and how you um, prioritize things was very important. I had the same reaction Mandy Jo had to looking at this ranking for uh, item two that that was a I saw that that was one of the universal um, high priority items along with the public you know the um, public construction project so that really was informative to me um, in reviewing all of this and data quickly this afternoon okay. are there any other questions on this I'm going to suggest a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and decide how much more we're going to get done Make sure you turn your camera off and your mic.
All right, let's keep, let's start moving back to our seats. Would you hit voice? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right, when you come back, please turn your photo back on, your video. So as we move forward and keeping in mind a hard stop, uh, I'd like to suggest that we take advantage of the fact that we have the town manager and the assistant town manager here. And we hear their feedback on each of the goals for each of the sub goals, if you will, for four, five, and six. And then to the extent we have time tonight, we'll go back and have discussions, but that we could hopefully start putting aside a small amount of time, at least at future council meetings to have that conversation as well. Is there anybody that disagrees with that approach? Okay, so Paul, we're going to go on to, uh, and David, I'm sorry. We're gonna go on to affordable housing. And let me just also say, I. I don't think we've said enough. Thank you to the staff and to the two of you for providing, you know, the input. And I, I understand at this point it's conversational, mm -hmm. um, but for many of us, it's just really good back and forth and good conversation. So thanks so much. So we're going to start with goal five, uh, four. This one is loaded. Yeah, um, and, and Dave is going to lead on this. And Dave is going to lead. Okay. Sure. So thank you, Lynn, and, and thank you for the conversation. I mean, I, I find this very helpful as well, and I'm sure Paul does too. Um, it's nice to have the conversation and dialogue about these things and, and have this give and take. So under this goal, we have objectives. Number one, ensure the operation of a seasonal and year-round shelter. You know, I think um, Paul and I and, and our police department, fire department, CRESS, inspection services spend a tremendous amount of time supporting Craig's Doors and the shelter at the ILC. Um, it's been, been operating extremely well over the past few years. We're very pleased with the way our partnership is going with uh, Craig's Doors. And of course, as you know, uh, you, utilizing ARPA funds, one of your goals was for the town manager to move forward on a permanent shelter. We're doing that right down the street at the VFW. We'll be hiring an architect very shortly and then launching a public process for visioning on a permanent shelter with supportive housing above uh, in the coming months. So that's number one. Would you like me to just keep going, Lynn? Keep going. And, you know, again, we'll come back to the extent that we have time tonight. So number two, I think we all recognize we have a housing crisis in Amherst. There's a housing crisis in the region, and it extends to the entire state. We're not alone. We can only do what we can do. But we do need to be part of the regional discussion and regional solutions. I think all of us have been on panels. We've attended workshops. We've attended um, panels. I remember the one uh, not too long ago at Amherst College with some of the some legislators and 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 the governor's staff. And so, I'm very proud that we're working with great great uh, uh, collaborate collaborators, partners like Valley CDC, um, Wayfinders, um, and many more. But um, you know the the uh, 30 home uh, home ownership project up on Ball Lane just uh, made its way through the permitting process. That's a, an extremely exciting project in my old neighborhood in North Amherst. Um, and then of course we have Wayfinders coming in with 78 units of rental housing, deeply affordable rental housing at East Street School and um, Belchertown Road. 
We're also combining funds on both of those locations. We're putting in CDBG funds at the same time to extend sidewalks and do new sidewalks in front of the E Street School, which will benefit not only the, the future residents of those, those apartments, those units, but also children and families who are utilizing the new Fort River School. And then we're extend, we're using CDBG funds as well to extend the sidewalks all the way um, all the way up to um, uh, the corner of Old Farm Road, uh, east toward Belchertown in front of many of the apartment complexes there. If you've ever walked on that stretch, it's a very challenging stretch with a very narrow old sidewalk. So these are ways we're combining housing funds and housing partnerships. Each of those projects, I don't have the total in my head, but I'm gonna guess it's probably on the order of $80 million between the two of those projects. So. Um, we're putting in CDBG funds, CPA funds, ARPA funds to leverage those projects. So really happy about those. Um, so that kind of, I kind of blended two and three. I think we can do more on the home ownership front. I think if any of you have um, been part of some of the discussions with Valley CDC as they've come through the, um, the various processes in town, they have been very successful at getting tremendous funding for that project. Those those units are going to be deeply, deeply affordable in the home ownership category. That is extremely challenging. How do you build those units in this in this economy, in this climate, when when units to build are between five and six hundred thousand dollars six hundred thousand dollars per unit, and then you're able to offer them on the order of somewhere in in the two hundred, two hundred and twenty five thousand dollar range. That's an incredible project. On the home ownership front, we have challenges. We have the cost, cost of raw materials. We have the availability of subsidies and tax credits. We have land, a limitation on land and time. And I think that's where we can partner, staff can partner with you. We need to be advocating more to the state for more resources through DHCD for those kind of deeply affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, we can move these projects. I think we've proven with 132 Northampton Road, with the Ball Lane project, um, Wayfinders is yet to come through the process. I think we've proven that we can move, we as a community, our permitting process can move fairly quickly to get these through, the, through our process. But to get the state funding sometimes takes years. Some of these projects might take seven years from vision to cutting a ribbon. That is a very long time to have loans, to uh, have staff, attorneys, and all the soft costs associated with this. So I think that's something we can do at the local level is we've got to do more advocating for uh, more permit, uh, more uh, funding and, and a quicker turnaround at the state level. Um, let's see, attainable rental housing. I think we've talked about that. We are also putting more um, ARPA funds into um, emergency assistance and emergency stabilization through family outreach. Um, let's see what else. Um, we're, we're talking with Amherst College and our partners at the university about how they might be able to help us on the land front. I think we all know that the governor has asked all state agencies to look at their land, to look at any surplus land. Are there ways that the university could help us with the, the land-based challenge. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything specific. I'd like more information on number five. I think that's something to be talked about. I'd like a little more definition on that one. Um, and then I think number six, we are going after every possible dollar we can in afford, for affordable housing. I think we're working closely with our affordable housing trust as you know, they're a great repository for CPA funds, for private dollars. They may be the recipient of, in the future of dollars uh, coming from a you know, possible downtown project. Um, so I think working with the Housing Trust is a key element of our, of our collaboration to get more units in the pipeline. Um, and we're always trying to keep uh, planes on the tarmac, if you will have things moving forward. And I think the other piece of this is what properties in Amherst, what properties does the town own that we can keep moving through that process? So we've got 
E Street School was a sur essentially a surplus property, a property that we didn't have a use for. It is now gonna be repurposed as affordable housing. We're gonna be looking very closely at the South Amherst campus, which is a piece of property that has been unused by the schools and now by the town for some years. We're gonna be looking at land we have off of um, Strong Street. Um, and then of course, we still have the frontage on Hickory Ridge to look at. So my goal is to always have projects in the pipeline ready to go in pre-development. So I think I'll stop there and take questions or Paul, if you wanted to add anything, if I missed anything. Um, uh, yeah. Paul. Did yes, you thank you. Yeah. So one of the, you know, so we're working on a lot of the different projects and one of the um, projects that will take an enormous amount of time uh, presented it itself as a solution. It was a sort of an opportunity that uh, town staff had identified and sought out and that's the permanent shelter and that's going to be a multi-year project that's going to require a significant investment of funds and will town funds as well as mostly state, we hope, uh, long term. But I think that's one of the things we want to make sure we're on the same page as a council, that that continues to be a, hot, a top priority because we are de dedicating a lot of time and effort into moving that project forward. Um, so just wanted to say it because a lot of these things are, are sort of moving on their own and this one is going to be propelled by the town staff specifically, I think. Okay, uh, quick comments on this so we can at least cover the input for the others. Pam? Thank you, I was, was pleased to hear Dave mention Hickory Ridge. And I think one of the, I'm not sure where it's covered, but um, providing information to us and to the public about sort of the status of the planning for Hickory Ridge is- a April 8th, I will be giving a PowerPoint to the council. Excellent. Thank you, that's very good news. Um, the, the sort of the status of Hickory Ridge, the status of the other quote unquote surplus properties or just the policy for dealing with surplus properties, um, I think is is a really good step in the in the motion. Absolutely. So just I will, uh, uh, during agenda setting today, talked with Lynn and, and Paul about giving a presentation on everything that's happening at uh, Hickory Ridge, including opportunities for reuse of the frontage. And I do want to, before Athena kicks me under the table, I, I misused the word surplus earlier. We need to keep, keep in mind we have a draft surplus property policy, but that is when the town wants to dispose of that property. I more was speaking about repurposing there are there may be surplus properties but there are also properties we want to repurpose and i saw athena looking my way and i knew <laughs> that i had veered into a a, and, a danger area so no yeah and yes that, i am yeah and that she, policy has that, already come out of the finance committee and i think at this point it's on for april 8th but we were trying to balance agenda so there's not too much on one night yes and you i know, just I mentioned just want to a... clarify that the surplus property <clears throat> policy that we discuss only applies when the town manager has mm -hmm. decided we don't we no longer need it for any purpose thank you in other words we are now declaring it surplus okay yes and i meant keeping it and repurposing in this case for housing there could be other potential uses that we look at as well and we'll talk a little bit about that at hickory ridge we know it's been mentioned in the context of a south amherst fire station and, and perhaps we'll have time to talk about that in a minute in another section okay kathy i want to go back to a, a Paul asked a question about the permanent shelter. And as I said earlier, I didn't really follow the instructions for our exercise, which was to use all my numbers. Um, I just went for my ones and twos, and I never put a four, five, and six. But what I noticed is many rated it less than a one, two, or a three. And my understanding is um, this is potentially, Paul, you said it's time and effort, but it's time, effort, and dollars. Um, in terms of before it becomes a reality. So tonight is probably not the time to have a longer discussion of this, but I um, I am not sure we thought, considered the entire cost of the project when we had what seemed to be free opera money to buy a building. So I just wanna go back at some point 
to take a look at that because I thought it was striking how many people gave it a relatively low score among the housing issues. That that's my only comment on okay. on the, this issue, Councillor Haneke. Um, two quick comments. The first one is this is the other one where sub goal three received a majority of councillors in their top ten ranking, um, beyond the major capitals where we'll see the other five, um, the other three of the five that got a majority of councillors. So I wanted to point that out, and that is proposing measures to retain, promote, and increase home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income residents. Um, and first time home buyers. But my other comment is um, it was great of you, Dave, to run down projects regarding housing, but items two, three, and four are about measures. Um, and I see that as legislation. Um, and none of that was discussed. And so I, I think we've done as a town a great job at supporting outside developers and their projects, but what we don't do a good job at is planning to promote through zoning and other measures, TIF bylaws, other things like that, housing. Um, and, and so I, I would love in a future discussion to hear the planning part, the zoning part, the other part of how we can promote housing and how the town council can help do that by passing measures. Yeah, happy to do that at a future date. I, I will say zoning to promote home ownership, that piece of it is a lot more complicated than say, but I did mention certainly the initiative in East Amherst and U Drive is really all about that. Maybe. Frankly, it's more about housing than it is about commercial and retail development because we know some of the challenges with that. But those initiatives by the planning board, particularly the one on U Drive, which is more further along, the one on in the East Village is more in a staff development, certainly speaks to some of that. Um, but yeah, the home ownership piece relative to zoning is is a bit more of a challenge. Absolutely. If I could just um, the one thing I want to make a point on the the um, shelter is that our goal, although it's not fully. Um, uh, design process yet is that yes there would be staff resource excuse me town resources put into that project we know we're putting arpa funding into the acquisition uh be a conceptual design demolition but very quickly after that our goal is to rfp the site for a developer to come in and build a shelter with associated um, housing so we you know we Paul has made it crystal clear. We know we are not in the sheltering business. This would be very similar to other affordable housing projects where we would RFP the site. And we've already had some preliminary conversations broadly with a number of developers who might be interested in such a project. They're happening, by the way, all over the state. So this is not a, a new model. Many other communities are using this hybrid shelter with permanent supportive housing in the same complex. So okay. that's our, our goal. Undoubtedly, there may be an ask, more additional asks of, say, CPA funds, CDBG funds, et cetera. But it would not be, you know, we would not be the central funder on a a multi-multi-million dollar project like that. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, again, responding, I think um, there was a question of what could the town or do uh, in terms of number five. And again, I would say, well, one thing they could do in conversations with the university, I mean, this is perennial ask, is to um, students having to move off campus puts a lot of pressure on the local housing market and certainly uh, drives prices up for home ownership and for uh, rental uh, um, dwellings. So encouraging the university to build more housing on campus and you know, maybe even to build camp uh, housing off campus for its faculty administrators and other employees that would help to expand our, uh, you know, long term year round population and of uh, households that also send children to our schools and we'll use our new library. Um, University drive is a measure that the planning department and planning board are, and that helps to stabilize neighborhoods and then there's um, we can 
not make changes that help destabilize neighborhoods, like um, I think maintaining the the four uh, occupant limits for um, non-related uh, um, members of households, because um, you know, like an effort to increase that number just makes um, it more profitable for investors to purchase the single family houses because it makes it that much more income that can be generated. So there's things we can do and things we cannot do to help to um, stabilize housing for our long-term residents. Bob Hagner. Yeah, the reason I ranked um, home ownership so high was that it really is the only way to um, for people to, you know, increase their opportunities for intergenerational wealth transfer. And renting doesn't do that. Uh, renting is great, but it's not the same thing as home ownership. Um, the one thing that I'm offering to you as a, as a thought is um, other communities where housing prices and land prices are very high, uh, the opportunities for younger people for new home ownership is, is through condos and townhouses. And we don't have a whole lot of those in Amherst. And I think if we could encourage more of that kind of development, that would ease, that would make it more affordable for people. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, I also just second what Bob and Jennifer just said. Um, one of the uh, other barriers that I would like to see addressed, um, and I know I've mentioned this before, but a lot of surrounding towns have down payment assistance programs for first time home buyers that Amherst does not have. Um, and I know we have the Affordable Housing Trust, but it only offers one large down payment to one family. And so I would like to see something a little bit more um, encompassing that first time home buyers might be able to access because for in order to increase opportunities for low income and moderate income residents, even if the, the house itself is a bit more affordable or there's more condo opportunities, like down payments are still a barrier. Um, and so I, I would like to see us explore that option. Um, and also, um, I think it was number five, stabilizing um, housing for long-term residents. So I was thinking about it a little bit more in terms of rental rentals and renters, just because that's what I'm more familiar with. And um, what I've seen is that people who have lived in their units for a very long time are still facing increases. Um, like my mom's rent is increasing every single year um, by hundreds of dollars. And so like, is there a way that we can monitor that or incentivize landlords to not do that or provide more assistance to families that is not just emergency assistance when they're behind on rent and facing eviction but just again with the goal of stabilizing housing and I know that Amherst Community Connections uh, was looking to pilot a program that would do such a thing but they didn't get enough funding to do so um, and I think looking into those kinds of things is what part of the reasons why I ranked those two a little bit higher than others. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Ryan. I'm hoping that the the low ranking that item number eight got is just a reflection of the fact that this is a long five-year process that's going to involve many pieces. But I, this is, a, my remarks are addressed to my colleagues here because I think town staff has done a really superlative job and has worked really hard on this, but it will require our continued commitment to the goal of eventually creating a permanent shelter in this town. Right. Uh, homelessness is a, an issue that I think we cannot ignore. It is a regional problem. We cannot solve it ourselves, but this is our, I think, a very important attempt for us to, to, to say this is something we need to do. And I understand that it's a long process and it's got many moving parts, but I hope that we will never lose our commitment to it. Thank you. I, and I just, it, as Councillor Ryan has pointed out, number five, eight is the same essentially, not completely, as four, one. Uh, they both deal with the homeless shelter. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, like Bob Hegner, I support uh, the development of duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, condos, and, um, 
several of us work very diligently to address zoning. Uh, and we're often stymied by the work of the planning department. So I guess I'm looking to the town manager and the assistant manager to help me understand how we can motivate the planning department, let alone the planning board, but the planning department to address in this kind of housing, which they've avoided uh, for a variety of reasons. Anna? I wasn't sure. If, did, did David, did you, you want to? David. I, it's, I would take that under advisement. It's, it's a great question. I think it's for a longer discussion. I'm not sure I would agree with the characterization of the, the planning staff and their approach to that. I think I would characterize it as what was proposed was not deemed to likely show as many results from that zoning change that the proponents of that change thought it might. So that's that interpretation. Well, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm I you know, I'm I'm basing that on the advice of planners with decades of experience. So that's the best I can do this evening. Anna uh sorry i got distracted okay um yeah i wanted to clarify i looking at goal four sub goal one operation of a seasonal year-round shelter i put that as number three for a similar reason as some folks when they looked at the elementary the same reason kathy that you talked about when you looked at the elementary school because when i looked at that goal i said yes absolutely i think this is important but we've made such significant progress and i know that one of the next steps would be to put out and seek bids for someone to develop it and they would run it. Right. And so for me, I, this is why I think it's important to not just look at the numbers and for us to explain some of the rationale. Um, I absolutely do think that's critical. I didn't rank it as my number one priority because I felt that significant progress had been made and I wanted the town manager's time to be spent more so on sub goals two and three. Thank just you. To clarify. Kathy, one last comment, then I'm moving on. Uh, yeah, I just want to jump in on duplex, triplex townhouses that I think we've got market forces that we're contending with the price of land, the price of construction, because if you look at towns around us, that there's no barrier to building them. It's just they don't come in very cheap anymore. You know, up in Sunderland, they have an entire, it was astonishing what each of them sold for. So that's one of the things the whole region is contending with that even where you're zoned to allow something, you'd rather build a big apartment building than a three person. So I think at some point we shouldn't jump to that we've got a barrier in our regs. We should be able to get some kind of analysis of what these market forces look like. So it's, and, and just Mandy, you said you look at the word measures and it means policies. I think measures can be interpreted by each of us in the way we want to. <laughs> so I think actions are measures as well as policies, but I just, I don't want us to think, cause I'm looking up in our area. Why don't we have more ADUs? Um, we allowed ADUs anywhere you want them and we haven't gotten very many. So it, there's a market out there and a construction cost that's, um, working against us. Okay, I'm gonna move on to major capital investments. Um, there was some clear consensus here. <laughs> Probably the most clear consensus among all the goals. Um, and I think some people like myself said, well, I want this before I want this, or I want that before I want this. And I would give it one or, you know, a couple here and a couple there. Uh, and at the same time, I'm just echoing what I heard earlier. Most of us having been at the groundbreaking yesterday are saying, hey, that elementary school is moving on. But as David has reminded us, the staff still has a lot to do. The library, the same thing. I'll take my double X away when we break ground there. Okay. I want to just keep making sure it goes forward. So is are there comments um, that... Paul and David, you want to make on the items here? Yeah, so I'll, I will group them 
numbers one and two, they're ongoing. We know we're committed to those. It, as, as Dave mentioned, Lynn just mentioned that planning, DPW, and special services are all going to continue to do it, dedicate significant time to these two projects. They're big projects, the largest projects in the history of the town. So, um, but the, we've broken ground on one and the procurement is a huge piece of it. Um, so that is moving forward as well, uh, especially for both projects. Um, three, four, and five are the ones that you just identified. And it was consensus in, in my reading of your document is the highest priorities for the, um, for the council and hearing that loud and clear. So the way we're prioritizing these is that if I want to work on a financing plan for you before, while we have the um, skill set of uh, Sandy Pooler with us. Um, and that would be targeting a July 1st date by, to have that ready, something like that ready. Um, in terms of identifying a location for the DPW, um, we're hoping to have something for sure by the end of the summer. Um, and then in terms of a location for the DP for the fire EMS, we're putting a deadline of October one on that. So we, I want to put dates out there so you can start to look at it and start to hold us account more accountable. Then I, th I think you have some frustration for that. And I think we want to start to target some deadlines for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, the, um, youth center and the senior center. Those are uh, the Banks Community Center is an ARPA driven deadline. So that is something we have to have designs for and then a way to set aside funds for by the end of uh, this calendar year. Um, and then for the Youth Empowerment Center, where their work, there needs to be work done in terms of identifying potential the needs and available facilities. And there's more than one way to create if we if the town wants to create a youth empowerment center we, we want to come up with different options available um the year and then this is the one where the development of the year-round shelter really came up it, it was in the previous goal but this is the the actual construction and one of the things that the reason one of the reasons we brought it up is that it received a relatively low ranking of 5.75 or at least the so that's, I want to make sure that we were, we're dedicating time and energy to this project. I want to make sure that we're on the same page as the council yet. Yeah, and, and Councilor Ryan has already identified it and other counselors have said, yes, it is a priority. So we're working under that assumption. If we're wrong, please say something because this is a project that as Dave said, once we get it into a situation and we get an RFP, which will take time and effort, we want to give it to a developer who will then um, move it forward. So, um, and when we say a developer, what we really mean is probably a nonprofit developer. And there are pl plenty out there, as Dave said, who are really interested in this. So uh, that's you how- You skipped six. I don't think it was on purpose. Six? Roads and sidewalks. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so that that's one, um, I think with the idea on this is to pre present a um, multi-year plan. And that's something we can, we're not going to be able to do that in the, we can sort of do, do what we did last time, but to develop the multi-year plan is going to take us a little bit longer during the course of this year. But it'll be before the um, bids go out in the, in the in the winter. Typically, we go out to bid in the winter for next year's roads. Yeah, uh, I'm going to just jump in and say, if I hadn't used up all of my rankings on the fire station and DPW and the financial plan, I would have had some left for those two others. <laughs> Which two others? Roads and sidewalks, and the um, um, see again. I'm thinking the senior center is a done deal. The youth center, we need more information. I probably would have given more for the year-round shelter. Okay, but it just you know, I used up three right on that sure. solid block, as did many other people. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, Paul, I heard you say you were going to be potentially coming to us with a plan on DPW. Um, one of my questions um, that, since these have just been working out in the background, is the current site of DPW, um, can't we just rebuild there, and uh, a DPW? And so I'm gonna have a lot of questions on whether we have to purchase another place. 
And I know that's been, we have going, and I don't need you to answer now, but I just think of the property we already own. Can't we make use of it? And can we give up the thought that everything DPW owns has to be in the same place? Because we have another place we can store some of the vehicles. So just thinking through um, what makes sense there. And the financing plan clearly is what order we we do these things in. So just on the one other, we, we had the beginning of a conversation, Pam and others, when you're saying the word surplus, but if we talk about reuse, we're going to have, it's not ours yet, but at some point, the Wildwood property will become available and putting it into the mix, and we can't put it into the mix till the town has it, and I understand that, but trying to think of, would that be re redeveloped? And one of my thoughts, and it'll be among many, could be, could the first floor be public use and could the upstairs be apartments? So we do a different kind of mixed juice where we get something we want to keep. We want to keep the gym. We want to keep some piece of it, but upstairs people can live because it's got 14 acres and it's got, it's got um, land. It's got land. It's got a parking lot. So I just think, you know, these are one year goals, but trying to think of over the next three or four years, what's possible with what we already own. And the other th way to think about Wildwood is if DPW needs to partly move, it could be swing space for DPW while something is being built. You know, but just it's it's a mix of a complex set of issues. And I don't know whether the council can grasp. I mean, it, it takes a lot of people thinking about it. So what I don't know is how much staff time you've got to really, you know, get into the nuts and bolts of this. And that's that's a question I'm just going to leave with because I don't think there's an answer right now. Andy. Yeah, I just want to comment on how I came about the uh, priorities because it partly answers the question Paul was raising about the seasonal and year round shelter. Uh, that one, I was one that I felt was uh, no longer uh, something that required a lot of attention from the council because I felt that we were in a phase now where uh, we own piece of property and uh, staff, you guys were working on uh, what the, uh, how to use and how to make that happen within the property. And therefore uh, you'd come to the council when action from the council was necessary, but it wasn't one we were gonna spend a lot of time on. Uh, the reason that I put uh, finding a location for the fire station and uh, for the DPW so high is that I can't help but reflect that uh, I uh, recall being on the finance committee back when John Mishanti was uh, town manager and Sandy Pooler was in his first uh, run at being the uh, finance director. And we were already working on that question how do we get those? How do we get those four projects done? How do we get them financed, and how do we get them done? And it seems like we we're so close on some of these things that we just need to keep moving them along, because uh, you know I've uh, now in my third term on the council after two terms on the select board and uh, some time on the finance committee, and I feel like we're talking about the same thing. And uh, so maybe it is time in my book to move it along before I, uh, while I'm still on earth. Um, the, uh, uh, and it, which brings me to the last thing I was gonna say was, um, I really think that it's important that we think about that Pomeroy property. Um, I think that there was a feeling that we finally had a good location for the fire station and we really could move forward with it. Um, and I don't understand why it has taken so long to close out a decision on that, that it's either the right or the wrong place, because it just seems like there was this broad consensus that it was a place that worked. But uh, on uh, uh, but, uh, it was uh, enough and uh, 
so we could really make a very usable and uh, accessible uh, spot there. Uh, and so I just uh, sort of a little bit of frustration is in my thinking about why I put that as to such a high priority. I just think we can close it out and be done. Councillor Haneke. Um, I want to echo Kathy's comments about DPW and and um, Andy's comments about making a decision on fire. Um, I know there, I've heard there's disagreement amongst whether we should move forward at Pomeroy with fire or whether we should hold out for DPW. So I, I assume that will be part of reports coming in, but, but um, I want to urge it's clear these are the other three that got of the five. That <laughs> This is extremely important to this council. Um, uh, many of us, uh, a majority of us, I think have been on this council five years and it's been important for five years. And I think we're getting tired of waiting. Um, and I think these rankings show we're getting tired of waiting. Um, I, I would like, and to encourage well, five for just this council. <laughs> I encourage um, creativity with DPW. I know there's been a desire to keep it all on one site, but after decades, I don't think we can ignore the possibility of needing to split it up or needing to make the footprint smaller by going higher. Uh, so that you don't need as large of a piece of property um, or ignore the possibility of looking at our zoning and seeing if there are proper zoning changes that could be made to make more properties feasible to put DPW due to increased, potentially increasing lot coverages or um, reducing parcel size, you know, something about lot coverage maximums or impervious surface maximums in certain areas for town services. Um, I think we it's time, it's past time to get creative about how to put a DPW in this town. Um, George. Uh, Paul, you set a deadline, I might not say for the fire EMS is October 1. I just didn't catch the deadline for DPW. September 1. September 1, thank you. And then... You mentioned the multi-year plan for sidewalks and uh, the road. Excuse me. You, uh, what you said was that the amount would be a little smaller than it's been in the past. Is that correct? Or did I mishear you? I, I may not have No, I said two things. One, one was... We can do an educational session like we did a couple of years ago to the TSO committee Thank that you. talks about how we prioritize. And then this 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 goal identifies a multi-year plan, and that wouldn't wouldn't happen until later in the calendar year. Right. I heard him say it'll take a little longer. Um, but that's okay. We're going to move on um, to goal six. And why don't we start with any updates? Sure. So um, goal six is racial equity and social justice. The first one is use a racial and ju social justice lens when making decisions. Again, we see this as an ongoing thing. Uh, goal, just like we did, looked with, um, um, with climate action. Um, part of this includes uh, re taking it and a review of town department policies and decisions using the equity lens. Um, we actually began this conversation with departments um, back in 2022. Um, the uh, We got a little bit sidetracked because the key people from the um, DEI director were involved in the interim leadership team for the Crest department. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're also looking at securing an actual assessment tool. They think that having a common tool that we can apply to every department is important. The second is to support the work of the town in repairing the damage of structural racism. So um, one, <clears throat> some of the efforts of the DEI department are about 
um, having a series of events aimed to engage community members in learning and dialogue about DEI topics. Many of you have participated in some of these. Um, the, the, I, the, the initiative of becoming a beloved community led by Dr. Love and would build on the National Day of Racial Healing that has happened. Uh, the next event is on April 4th, and there's a number of other events that are already scheduled to have that. It's, it's a conversation. It's a dialogue um, on that. Number three is provide training regarding racial equity rights and other options to the town council employees and members of the public. So the DEI department continues to provide monthly workshops and, and targeted training specifically through by department. Um, the um, DEI department does offer trainings to the town council if it chooses to uh, avail themselves to those trainings, they're available to help with that. The next one is begin to identify and propose revisions to policies, bylaws, and regulations to dismantle structural racism. So this sort of already addressed this a little bit in terms of the overall goal, but one of the specific goals that we're having an active discussion now is about marijuana uh, and cannabis um, regulations and bringing uh, a social justice lens to, to all of our policies on the permitting and regulation of cannabis. Um, this is also a goal of the uh, Cannabis Control Commission. They're issuing new guidelines. Our planning department and licensing group is, are actively looking at this and what it means for our town. And the last one is to incorporate input from BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and other marginalized communities and appropriate town committees when reviewing and revising policies and regulations. So the DEI department really sees the, their main conduit of hearing from other from groups is because they staff the Human Rights Commission, the Disability Access Advisory Committee, and the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And they depend on these volunteers and people who serve on these committees um, to help guide their work. We have not made very much progress with an English speaking population, non English speaking populations. Um, they're aware of the challenges that that presents. Um, and so again, and, and this is where the equity assessment tool will become in handy because I think this will be something that where we can judge how the town is doing um, across all of our departments. Okay. George, you have your hand up. Just to maybe try to explain some of my um, rankings such as they are. I mean, like many of these, I struggled uh, to try and put numbers to this question mark doesn't mean that I don't think it's important. Um, I think what it means is that I'm trying to, I mean, for instance, number one is I assume simply a given that we use a racial and social justice lens when making decisions. Um, so I don't know, you know, priority one, I guess, but I mean, it's just a given. Um, number two, likewise, question mark, because for me, a lot of what I think of as um, racial justice is involved with actual concrete actions. So home ownership, um, the new school, uh, a thriving CREST program, um, programs related to youth empowerment, and we're still waiting to see what will happen with reparations. So those are the kinds of things I look to. Um, the other items, you know, they have value. I think for instance, number three, we have asked the staff to do DEI training. Seems that the council should do this. Um, so that would be my thought there. Um, so just a brief comment about my sort of strange numbers. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ette. So number three, says provide training regarding racial equity rights and other options to the town council and i'm wondering what other options mean um paul i did not write this i, to, I would like to the council to say what they meant another one of those yeah. vague references at the end of a sentence um you if you'd like to fill in the blank perhaps you have an idea pat 
wants to fill in the blank. Ah, no, Councillor Lord wants to fill in the blank. Well, I read it as um, like trainings around, oh, wait, what, what number is it again? Number three. Thank you. Um, Racial equity rights and other options to me would be like maybe the history and strategizing different ways to dismantle the oppression as opposed to like not trainings, but just other things that would help propel us to actually use a lens deeply, deeply embedded in equity and stuff beyond just racial equity and uh, what was the second thing? Rights, quote unquote rights. So it might might be events as well. Okay. Pat, you have your hand up on this one too. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm one of the kidding. things that um, I've been talking to um, the folks from Embrace Race, um, and Melissa Giro and Andrew. We can't hear you, Pat. And Andrew um, Grant Thomas, and they have a program called Drawing Difference. Uh, we've been taught to be silent.